I want to say thank you guys for being here. Obviously, yes. I realize Sunday morning, we all have stuff to do, but I uh, appreciate you guys taking the time uh, and being uh, willing to uh, up your game as coaches. And that's what Tracy and I take very, very seriously in our own practice, and we are super excited to share that same sentiment with you guys. Okay, I am Tracy, and I am a strength coach and a competitive power lifter. I am on the um, USAPL national team for 2020. And I began my strength journey um, about eight years ago at, with kettlebells and then slowly went into barbells at the young age of 42. So I will be 50 in two weeks. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna be, I use all of the different methodologies and tactics that we're going to be going through today in my own training and it's helped me um, gain tremendous strength over con consistently over the eight years um, as well as stay injury free so I'm excited to uh, to share that I like to share anything strength and I like to learn from other coaches and I like to um, share with other coaches as well what are your powerlifting numbers? Everyone wants to know. Yeah, sure. So um, squat is 320, uh, bench is 203, and deadlift is 402. Nice. <laughs> nice. Huh? Yeah, I'll be 50 in two weeks. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> cool. And my name is Zach. I have been a strength coach for going on 10 years, and much in that same vein, what we're going to be going over today is kind of the general overview of how I approach my own training and those who I coach. So what I hope that we can get, get a good feel for here is how the small tips and tricks, cues and tactics can translate into the macro programming themes, right? So, a very brief overview of what we got going on today is our five main patterns and then we have a couple of uh, lifts that we're going to workshop within those patterns to help fill gaps and just kind of hearing you know some of the feedback from you guys in terms of well how do we kind of modify things on the fly for our clientele I think you guys are going to come away with a lot of cues and tactics that will help you as well as a lot of ideas of how you can translate this stuff into programming that spans months and even years depending on the type of clientele that you're working with. Cool, so it's, uh, this is all this, this stuff that I nerd out on pretty much all day every day. So always excited for the opportunity to help you know, share that with other coaches. So with that being said, uh, what we are gonna do is follow that general uh, uh, schedule and we're going to get your questions at the end of each section right so we're going to be coming at you fast and furious with a lot of stuff in each of those sections and then we're going to leave a little bit of time at the end of each of those for Q&A and then we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A in general at the end okay so with that Let's get started. So a great way that is going to simultaneously help warm us all up and go over a key core lift uh, will be the carry sequence. Farmer's carries, suitcase carries. So Tracy's gonna kick us off with that. Okay. So with farmer's carries there, have y'all done farmer's carries before, suitcase carries? So they're one of my favorite and our favorite um, ways to train the core because um, they're easy, anybody can do them, but making sure you do them right, making sure that you, know, you maintain tension, it work, it's full body, train stability. Um, so I warm up with them a lot, I'll incorporate them throughout my training, do them at the end. Um, so let me grab the, and you can do them when you do farmer's carries, we'll do them with kettlebells, you can do them with heavy dumbbells. You can do them with trap bars. Um, we'll do them, which we'll talk about later. I like doing them with bottoms up kettlebells because that, if anything really forces you to stay really tight, put the kettlebell bottoms up. Um, 
So when, when you're doing the farmer's carries, and we're gonna, I'm gonna just show it real quick and then I'm gonna have you all, we're just gonna get right into it and get it. But farmer's carries are two bells, suitcase, which you'll hear is with one bell. I find suitcase carries to be more challenging than farmer's carries because farmer's carries will um, balance you out. Suitcase really forces you because you, you want to maintain and stay straight. So when I'm doing a farmer's carry, I, and again, picking up one thing I think, you know, especially when you're coaching and when I've coached people who are, you know, new, course the first thing I say is pick up and they just reach down and grab and you know they're gonna get hurt right there so I try to teach them that when they're picking up anything uh, any type of weight at all just to get in the habit of always treating it like almost like a deadlift which we'll go through just to where they put their weight into their legs and pick it up so anyway with the farmers carries I'll get them and the other some of the other things that I'll see people do is you know when they're doing a carry you know, they'll, they'll just kind of walk like this, um, making sure that when, you, when you're doing a carry that you keep your staying, you're keeping your core tight, shoulders back, and don't, it's okay if the bells or the dumbbells rest against the legs or touch the legs, but you don't want them resting against it. You almost want to try to keep it back because that forces you, you'll feel the tension. Um, one of the cues that I like to think, because telling people, get your core tight, get your core tight doesn't mean anything to almost anybody who's just starting there I don't know what you mean so a lot of times my favorite cue which Zach will know is I try to make people visualize if I came up to you and I'm gonna punch you sometimes I do but you know I'll punch you just think of that and that's the description and a lot of them will just immediately tighten up I'll pretend I won't actually hit them where you can but um, that automatically will make you just kind of tighten up. And so that's a cue, a way that I will get people to start to kind of get used to what I mean when I say brace your core. So with the, with the farmer's carries, I'll get it up. And then of course, just walk. I try to walk slow. I don't, I'll see people going really fast with it. Walk slow or put up your leg, march. And you can tell it's really hard stay tight keep my shoulders back so um, I'm gonna have y'all go ahead and get uh, either two dumbbells two kettlebells get something that's about maybe like a third body weight so maybe somewhere between 40 55 pounds two of them um, kettlebells or dumbbells <laughs> so, you know, it's funny. I mean, this is a farmer carry. It's a simple thing, but literally this is how you get and put up your weights. Yep, it you is. You deadlift your weights. Yep. I think it's important to, like, we do a ton of accessory work after at least, like, three to four workouts a week. Yep. So if it's, like, core stuff, carries, front rack carries, and I think I try to express some our classes like those are super important you know people see like dumbbell curls and carries they're like all right cool see ya right I'm like no if it's actually really good accessory work you're going to be really tired after yep and i don't think people realize just how how much yeah, good and carries and and, and superset one thing that i have found is supersetting carries with something else that yeah. they like to do so that it can be rest but it's not really rest right. and we'll do it for carries so we'll do it for um, time so you'll say and actually maybe we'll do that we'll do it for time but you say a minute and they'll go for a minute and you know they'll think oh this is easy and it gets yes. towards the end of the minute and they're like because it really does work your grip and your form as well um, and like you said, rack, I love rack carries. Rack carries are good if they're maintaining tightness, staying tight. Overhead carries, um, so many iterations of it. Or you can do, we'll do like a certain number of steps, you know, do 20 steps, turn around, come back. So there's like a million different ways that you can do it, but incorporating it. But people will find that training your, um, for training your core, you gain tremendous amount of, um, core stability and core strength from farmer's carries. That's one of the things I think has carried over tremendously to my strength training. 
So what I'll have you do, we'll do farmer's carries and then we'll do um, just a couple suitcase carries. So you'll pick up your, we'll just kind of, we'll, uh, uh, I don't want to really do a circle. <laughs> we'll kind of walk, that'd be funny. We'll just walk around the circle. We'll just pick it up and we'll yeah. kind of go back and forth a little bit just to, and what I'm going to do when you're doing it is I'm going to kind of watch and give you like watch how you're doing it. But think as far as cues, think shoulders back, try to really stay, just really stay tight. If you don't think you're, I mean, if you think you're tight, get tighter because the tighter you are and the more um, uh, overall uh, um, stability, I'm trying to think of the right word. Anyway, the, e the harder it will be, it'll become a whole lot harder than you think. And also try to think of not touching yourself with the bells. Try to keep them out a little bit. So, and keeping your lats tight. So if you want to just kind of, just kind of, you know, maybe go 15, 20 steps back and forth and I'm gonna kind of look and definitely think when you pick it up. So, yep. And breathe, when you're breathing, that's the other thing is breathe, is breathing. Yeah, I know, I was just gonna say, don't hold your breath. Stay tight, but think of breathing to help. So breathe in and breathe out through your diaphragm. So breathe out through your, try to breathe into your belly. Okay. Oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah, shoulders back a little. Looks good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, holding them out makes a big, right. Exactly. Like, like kind of bounce it yep. off and I always forget. Yeah. And to me that, and that is what really makes it yeah, like, where, like the arms come into place. Yep. You're like, yep. Oh, there's my triceps. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that, so the other thing with, which we'll do this, we'll kind of do this for a minute is let's do just marches. So instead of, you know, walking back and forth, you can also just pick them up and do this and very slow. So think of holding them out and just slowly, and it's way harder than it sounds. So go really slow, hold it, and that, again, is a really good way to force, and they don't need, again, heavy to do that, so hold it and march really slow. Yeah, nice. Yep, it looks good. <laughs> Okay, yeah, guys. So when you're doing your carries, this is basically like your uh, like a dynamic plank. Yep. Right. A dynamic exactly. vertical plank. And nice. obviously, we know that single leg work is super important. So every time you drive your knee high here, you're doing basically a single leg deadlift lockout. Right. So balance and coordination yes. can be as easy as just stabilizing up on one leg. So by doing your carries, whether or not you're doing them slow and high knees or just walking around, when you're putting that intention into shifting body weight and, and extra load foot to foot, that's about the most functional balance exercises you can do that requires minimal coaching. Yep, yep. So, and then we'll just do, so suitcase carry again, which for me, I, I often feel like that's more challenging, especially the heavier the weight gets. And it is, I do challenge, sometimes I'll use, I'll take a um, uh, different size bells. So you have a little bit, that makes it harder as well. So I might use a 16K and a 32K, and that also forces you um, to kind of make sure that you're maintaining the stability. So I'm just gonna do, one so try to everybody you all can do it too but suitcase same thing keep the bell from not touching touching your leg and then just walk and you'll see for at least for me it feels okay yes suitcase is one so what i'll often do with a suitcase carry is walk like the length one way with one bell switch sides and walk back the other way. And again, slow, you know, keep everybody walking slow, but either's fine. It's just, it trains different, you know, different gotcha. levels right. of stability. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> 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 
Always try to keep your face relaxed. Yep. Your breath yep. deep in the nose. <laughs> Crown of the head high. Yeah, and you see, so doing this, yeah. it makes it, I, I like doing like that because it. it makes it really, because it, it it's trying to train the balance as well. Yeah. I like that teaching people because they do. We'll just we'll do them a lot, like our laps outside, and they'll just kind of like walk. Yep, it exactly. And like, oh, guys, sure yes, that. and if they understand, it really is helping. Yeah. So. They're holding this out, not just letting it bend your legs. Yeah. Usually we're just going for it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, like try doing the most side. Until which side is crappier. Yeah. The side is so much shorter. So those, again, like I said, I like to, um, you know, you can incorporate them almost any time in, and I do like doing them with supersets, just yeah. because I feel like, you know, just doing that, it's like. But if they're doing that and they're incorporating it with something else, um, you are, I try, you know, trying to incorporate core or mobility throughout the training where they don't really know it. It's, you know, they might be resting and that gives them a way to make sure that's incorporated into the training program. So um, that's it. When, when we talk about bottoms up um, presses later, I'll just show a bottoms up carry, but I love bottoms up carries. I think they're great for shoulder stability and shoulder strength as well. And they really, really force you because when you have a bottoms up kettlebell, if you like lose your tension, lose your tightness, that bell is just going to fall over. So you really have to stay, um, stay tight with that. So I think as far as cues, finding things that like, like I said, keeping the bell away, finding little cues that force them to get into that position, you know, why they don't have to think about it, is probably one of the best things um, that you can do uh, with all of this. So that's it for farmer's carries. Cool. Now, can I ask a question on that? Absolutely. Uh, I guess more so a role play scenario. Um, so we actually, I would probably say once a week have some sort of carry and it's in a workout with the timer running, as crossfitters do. Yep. Um, if you were the coach and you're briefing the workout to a class and that's in there, some sort of carry, how would you explain it to instill in them speed is not the focus? Because that's what we all do. We just grab it and we take off as fast as we can. But what you're not you telling them to do number of steps, right? It's just... It's not steps. No, it'll be like a lap around or back. Part right. Around. So make sure they understand. Time is not important. You're, a minute is a minute. You're going to do a minute of, you know, farmer... Unless they're trying to, they're trying to get to a destination. Well, yeah, it's, it's on a running clock. So yeah. in their head, time is everything. <laughs> yeah, so how true. You, how would you explain the importance of, like, don't rush it? Like, what words would you use? How would you? <laughs> I'm like... Well, I would just say... Time is time. If the goal is a minute time under tension, then that is the metric by which we're training. We're not training distance, we're training time. But they're trying to get there fast. Well, then in that case, <laughs> I would maybe just have them march in place. You know, if, because we know environment and people's psychology is very environment dependent. So if you say we're gonna go out in the parking lot, that's where their mind is going. If you say, tighten up, I want you to slow march in place for a minute, keep your focus, then just by changing the environment, you're changing their mindset. Gotcha. Yeah. So basically but, putting it in a four time cross the workout is probably not a good idea. <laughs> well, but you, you, well, you could make it, um, you could always make it part of their warm up. You could make it at the end for, you know, make sure at a time, because I do agree, if somebody's doing something for time and you say go slow, yeah. they're going to be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or like so it's four time format, whatever movement, like whatever carry it is, keep that in a time frame within the workout. Yeah, you could say Yeah, you could you could say a thirty second farmer's carry. So, yeah. And if and if it is a fixed fixed time, then thirty seconds is thirty seconds and then but you need to go slow and I think making sure they understand that going slower <laughs> is is what's going to give them the benefits of it the you know if they're just grabbing it and running it it's not you know giving them what they're going to gain from it which is the strength but I agree with that I think if you do a 
say in here's the you know here's the the you know training program for today and here's you have a 30 second farmers carry in the middle of it and if they know that then they'll probably slow down yeah yeah that's a good question though because you know to fit in your environment yeah, so <laughs> exactly cool right on all right so moving on from our carries we're getting down into the turkish getup okay so we obviously have started with something that's relatively simple standing walking around we're going to add a little bit of complexity and now we're also going to do some groundwork so also from a programming perspective Carries and, and get-ups, or carries and floor work, very potent combination. Getting down and up off the floor. We're going to keep our get-ups unweighted today, but going from unweighted body weight floor work to heavy loaded standing work, very, very effective programming technique. So, is everybody familiar with the get-up, the Turkish get-up? So what we're going to do is we're just going to drill the first three steps. We're not going to we're not going to break down the whole shebang all the way up and all the way down. We're just going to focus on the first three steps because I think those are really the three most important steps of the get up. And from a programming perspective, most people get most benefit from the floor to the high bridge sequence. Okay? And then if you want to work on your, you know, standing lunge and your, you know, tall overhead work, that's where carries, waiters carries can come into play. So, let's come on down on your back. And I'm going to really briefly go over our first three steps here. So if you guys know, you have a posted side, right? That's where you're, that's where you're loaded through this hand, and that same side foot is planted. Then you have a free side. So your free side, your leg and your arm are out at about 45 degrees. So the first step from here is going to be a roll to that free elbow. Right like so. Cool? Just to the elbow there, yeah. Now, what I, what I want you to be sure that you end up, when you're in this position, I want you to keep in mind two things. One is your chest is facing diagonally up and out, not, not down and not too far up to the ceiling. It's diagonal. You also want to create space, yeah, with your downside shoulder and create space with your top side shoulder. All right, so you're pulling your lats down and your shoulders into socket. So you've got good space here. All right, so when you're actually doing the rep, obviously you're keeping your eyes on your top hand here. Step number two is we're going to straighten out that bottom arm. So we're in a, what I call a post, arm post. Same deal here, keep that shoulder back. No, you know, no scrunching into the shoulders. And then from here, we're going to add the bridge. So third step is the bridge. When you bridge up, I want you to think about your hips going diagonally, up and out, not straight up to the ceiling. So come on up into that bridge. We'll hold for about 10 seconds here. Good. For four, three, two, take a seat. Back down to the elbow, wave back down to your back. Now let's switch sides. Opposite feet and hands. Let's roll to the elbow. Good. There you go. Post to the hands. Diagonal bridge. Now when you're in this diagonal bridge, keep that extended foot relaxed. Not much tension. You want to be thinking about posting strong on your flat side foot. Take a seat. Back down to the elbow. Wave down to your back. Those are the first three steps. Probably something you guys are all familiar with, yeah? So just a couple of, just a couple of cues to kind of fill gaps here. One, you've probably seen this a lot. When people try to do a get up, they try to crunch and this leg comes up and they get stuck. But it's not a crunch. Remember, it's a diagonal roll. 
So my goal is not height on the roll up. It's literally to get myself from flat on the floor to diagonal off the floor. Does that make sense? It's very subtle, but very, very important. Because especially when you're using a heavy weight, you're not going to lift yourself up. That's not going to work. But you are going to roll under the weight. Does that make sense? So, so you're, you're using your leverages in an intelligent fashion. And then from here, you post. And then from here, you're doing the same basic diagonal idea by bridging your hip up. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's do five reps on each side. Just do these at your own pace, elbow, hand, high hip. I want you to hold the high hip position for about five seconds and then come on back down. And we're just going to mosey around and take a look at how you're moving here. Do keep your eyes on your top fist, top hands. There you go. Very nice. Always creating space. And watch your noggin to make sure you don't roll back on any dumbbell or yeah, kettlebell. I've, I've heard that before. It happens. <laughs> Situational awareness is very, nice. very important on really these. Nice. Feel good? These are looking pretty good, guys. Okay. Remember, keep that extended leg nice and relaxed. And when you're holding that high bridge, really try to crimp that posted side glute. Cool, guys. Everybody's looking pretty good. So after you wrap up your five here, we're just going to go over a couple more cues that you can use with folks that might really help solidify this pattern. So in general, we can probably all use more floor work. So the get up offers us a great opportunity to get that in. And if, and if all we're doing is focusing on the first three steps, we're, because we're not worried about the sweep, the hinge, and the, and the lunge up, which is where most people's brains get fried, we're just cutting that out completely and instead focusing on more volume from the floor to the bridge. Again, looking at it from like a fall recovery kind of standpoint, the most important thing is getting your body into a position where you can get that center of gravity back up under you, right? Because, you know, if you find yourself in a dicey situation on your back, this is obviously not where you want to be. So, the quicker you can train yourself to get your hip up and having the ability to get your feet back up under you, get your center of gravity back up under you, the better. So for your elderly clients, huge. For your athletes, huge. For everybody else, huge. So, like I said, a lot of people struggle with that role. If you really cue the diagonal, and not the crunch. That should take care of most of your issue. But if not, here's a foolproof way to catch the feeling of the diagonal roll. If you grab a hold of a weight kettlebell here on its side, grab a hold of the handle and with the intention of stabbing it into the grounds, there's your roll up. Then you can let it go. You notice how I, I scooch around. A lot of people will say, like, your hand has to be planted. I don't really think so. Scooch around to wherever, like, you feel most open through the chest and do that. So let's practice that, that anchor with, uh, yeah, you can use a dumbbell or a kettlebell. Dumbbell might be a little tricky, but give it a shot. Yeah. 
But now make sure that the, that the anchor is at that 45 degree, not 90 degrees, 45 degrees. All right? So you have kind of a close uh, armpit angle there. So stab the weight into the ground and roll up. Let's switch your feet there. There you go. Arm up. Good. Yep. That's it. And then once you hit that roll, you can let go of it and do the rest of the repetition. So does that make sense, guys? Very, very simple. But using some sort of external cue, something that you can kind of pull and push against, really helps that diagonal. So, little bonus, little bonus. One of Tracy's favorite getup variations, the baby getup. Oh yes, this one. I'm. T this is one of the. If you give this to people, I I was doing it once um, in one of with a group of other powerlifters, and they're like, ah, that's easy. And they go and get a bigger bell so they can you know prove me that they're stronger, and it they. <laughs> They were embarrassed very quickly because this is very humbling. It is a very good core exercise. It will, I love giving this to people to do almost all. Yeah. So, you know, depending on, you know, your client's style and psychology, they may not want to spend the time, especially in the context of a workout, really refining those get-up repetitions. I get it. I mean, we could, we could spend three days just talking about the get-up. Very, we're super duper detail oriented. And that's very important, you wanna have that side. But a lot of times, people just wanna feel the burn, move around, I mean, we're in, cross, we're in a CrossFit gym for God's sakes, so of course people wanna feel the burn and move around. So one thing that you can do to kinda, again, give a, a fun little variation, is after somebody's really got that roll, and at least has like the basic pattern, the cross body pattern, the get up down, you can add this variation. The rule is feet are together and the floor is lava for your feet. So feet may not touch the ground. You're gonna get in that same setup, diagonal roll, post to the hands. <laughs> feet are together, feet don't touch the floor. Do you have a weight in your hand? You have a weight in your hand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not at first, <laughs> not at first. Back down to the elbow, back down to your back. Now, of course, what you could do is roll, post, and actually do your bridge. There's a million ways to hack it. But let's try that. So come on down to your back, feet together, floor is lava for your feet. <laughs> and roll to your elbow, pause. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Your butt. Yeah. <laughs> post up to your hands, pause. Again, keep the shoulders down, good space. Roll back to the elbow. Diagonal roll back down to your back. Now, because you're not using a weight, let's just go ahead and switch arms. And let's try the other side. Roll to the elbow, pause, tall chest. Post to the hands, tall chest. Really get those knees up into your torso there. Back down to the elbow, roll back down to your back. And relax. So, again, to kind of give you guys a little, just kind of off the cuff, type of programming idea. Roll on one side, roll on the other. You could maybe even go back and forth for a minute. Suitcase carry, down and back. Roll to the post. Maybe five on each side. Slow high knee march carry. Come back down, do another get up variation. So you see what you're doing is is your, your weight is static in both of those exercises. In the carry, your weight is static. You're not, you're not moving the weight. You're, kind of, you're actually kind of moving yourself around the weight in a roundabout way. It's the same thing with a getup. You're not, you're not pressing the weight, you're not pulling the weight. It's just there and you are moving around it. Does that make sense? I'm gonna do one weighted just so Please do. See.
I have a microphone stuck in my back. <laughs> so we'll yeah, watch see. that. Watch yeah. that pack. So. Pause. Now, she can straighten her arm. There you go. <laughs> and back down to the elbow. And roll back down to the back. You notice how I always say roll onto the back? Do not flop. Make it a wave. Just how you do a diagonal wave roll up, do a diagonal wave roll down. You want to demonstrate the other side? Okay. <laughs> you know, exactly. You know, exactly. Here. Yeah, oh, and we, when we switch bells with the Turkish getup, instead of having them bring it over, we always switch it around safely. Yeah, point of safety. Halo the bell around your head on the floor. Do not bring it over your face. Bring it over your head. Exactly. Pause. Straight. And down. Good. Nice. So you can see, guys, <laughs> there's, you know, especially, again, with our first couple moves here, there's always great opportunity to pause and to slow down to fill movement gaps. Something that I like to do with carries is just have people, like, do high knees and on my stop, have them freeze. Go. Stop, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, you're simultaneously teaching people how to move dynamically, standing fashion, low to carry, and moving themselves on and off the floor. Very, very important you know, physical training skill. So moving on from there. I was going to say one more thing, just when you're teaching people Turkish get-ups, and I'd mention this to you, is um, that I really like to do to help kind of teach them t about keeping, to prepare them for when they're going to add a weight, is using your shoe. So putting your shoe, yep. taking your shoe off and balancing it, or a yoga block, but a yoga block is like near impossible. It's very hard. Yeah. But that's a way to kind of teach. I'll just show it with a yoga block real quick. But because if you, even for your own practice, it's something people can do at home, but, they, but it teaches them so they can kind of practice the movement. It, just the half, doesn't even need to be the whole, but it teaches you. We'll see if I can actually get it to stay. Also makes you go slow. So that's just another way, and that's where they won't get hurt, but it teaches them the movement in general. And it's, I love to show people that because it teaches them to stay slow, teaches them to, they have to stay tight, and it's fun. Because every time I have done this in a class, they, with the, either the shoe, they take the bottom of their shoe and do it, or when they do this, they, they love it. So it's a fun way to kind of train that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when you actually start adding load to that top hand, you know, you, you, get, a, you get into a whole nother realm of, you know, how the body moves. But again, for most people, just training those couple variations, just working on the bottom three steps for a period of weeks or potentially months will really help set the stage for adding weight down, down the road. And then with the balance component, balancing a block, balancing your shoe, that's huge. That's huge. And it almost automatically helps people, you know, clean up their movement patterns and get that roll as opposed to that crunch, which you'll see for the majority of people is like their number one problem. Cool? Dig it. All right. The tug of war plank. So this is a great transition move from our core component into our hinge because this particular plank variation is obviously going to be stellar for your core strength, but it's also going to teach the end position of our deadlift and swing. Okay, So just how we talked about with the carries or a standing plank, 
the top of your swing and the top of your deadlift is a standing plank. So, let us demonstrate the tug of war plank. And this is another one that in, you know, when I'm working with people, if they can't quite grasp, you know, the, the maintaining the tightness, tightening their core, as soon as I put them in this position and do this, one, they love it because it just gives them that feeling. Um, it forces them into that. So this is, to me, one of my favorite drills for teaching that, the t staying tight in a plank. Yep. So you're going to want to grab probably a, a light, small kettlebell. So the person who's planking will be on a forearm, will be in a forearm plank position. And the whole thing that we're cueing here is total body engagement. And really like the best way to do a plank is thinking like you're almost trying to scissor yourself into the ground isometrically, which is kind of hard to convey to most people. So this is like the next best thing. So planking partner is down on the forearms and we'll grab a hold of the belly. Actually, you know what we can do? We can actually switch this. Okay. Planking partner can actually grab a hold to the handle and the pulling partner will grab a hold of the belly and pull. Pull for about 10 seconds. Now as the planking partner, I'm thinking about pushing my heels back. I'm thinking about driving my elbows down and back into the ground for three, two, and one. And then you can switch. So you can do partner one, you know, one does the plank, one pulls. And pulling can, can get kind of tiring too, depending on how, because uh, their, their goal, I'll tell them, you know, your goal is to not let me pull you, you know, away. And so they're, pull, they're staying as tight as they can. I'll start pulling a little bit harder, giving a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, they get, it does the trick. Yeah. So, so we want to have, yeah. It's, a, it's maybe a little bit tricky on this rubber flooring, but the idea still translates pretty well. So yeah, get with a yeah, partner. Yeah, we want to have you get probably get a smaller bells for these because not the bigger. I'd get a smaller bell just so you can hold on to it from both ends and get a partner. Now, of course, you don't have to be in that split position pulling partners. You can be in half kneeling. You can be standing, you know, depending on what pair of pants you're wearing. For about 10 seconds. Planking partner, push your heels to the back wall. There you go. Okay. Oh my gosh. Oh shit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> nice. So think of yep, read it. Yep. So when you're on like a smooth surface, you you can easily actually pull your partner, uh, you know, across the ground. So it's kind of like an isometric body saw. If you've ever done body saws. Same kind of idea. So you want to try to push, you said, to the back wall? Heels? Okay. heels to the back wall. Yeah, okay. That helped. I could think about that. Yeah. Yep. Don't they, do they call, like this without the partner in the kettlebell, do they call that a RKC plank? Basically, okay. yes. Yeah, so the whole premise behind the RKC plank, you're exactly right, is to drive elbows down and into the ground, drive heels back, drive toes up and into the up and in towards your elbows. So it's like you're trying to do this against the grounds. And this is like the easiest way to teach it. Right, right. Now, one other cue here. Pulling partners, slow and steady. Don't yank, ramp it up. Because what you want somebody to do is to stay in position, you don't want them to do that. If you see their head start to travel forward, they're, they're decreasing the leverage. You want that 90 degree angle. If someone starts doing this, then it's defeating the purpose. So that's why here, heels back, and then you tell your partner, don't move your head. Slow and steady with the tension, and when they stay in that same position, you know they're making up for it here, not there. Keep the breath deep through the nose. Yep. Don't scrunch your face. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Ooh. Yeah. We're the last time I went. Like that. Right. 
but just keep yourself there. And if you want to make it harder, like I said, push the heel back or just tell your partner, keep dialing it up. You could probably also do this with other implements besides a kettlebell. Yep. I mean, if you have spare rings around, like rings would probably be good. Anything that you can just grasp Grab a hold to, to and that your partner could pull. And Molly, Molly, yes. right? Molly brought up a good thing. She asked, she said, is this similar to like the RKC plank that you would do? It, 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 yeah, and it, it exactly is. So with an RKC plank, as you know, you, can, you, ha, you can't do it longer than 10 seconds because you're doing maximum tightness. This is a way to teach people that because, you know, again, just telling them what to do, sometimes it's not as easy as showing them. And to me, this, this shows that. So it's exactly the same, the same thing. Yep. So when you, when you train your student to get that intra-abdominal tension, that full body engagement from the neck down, not the neck up, neck up is relaxed, neck down, you're a marble statue. Once they can feel that consistently with the tug of war plank, then it can carry over. To they can end. do it by themselves yep. and they can imagine pulling against the imaginary partner. Exactly. And then that is going to translate very well to the rest of our lifts. Yeah. All right, so we're moving on into the hinge, right? So the hinge is your posterior chain dominant lifts. Preeminent ones being your deadlift and your swing. Uh, just, just for the sake of time and equipment, we're not going over the barbell deadlift in detail today but we're still gonna cover all of our bases using the kettlebell, which judging by what some of you guys said might, might be a good thing because all else being equal, a kettlebell deadlift is a little bit more user friendly than a big old barbell deadlift. So, Tracy Cook. You're doing. Am I doing deadlift? I am doing deadlift. Yeah. <laughs> so, for the deadlift. Again, we're just gonna start with basic cues and principles and then we can hack them from there. So. Ideally, if somebody is already kind of strong and competent with their carry, that's almost, I would consider like a little bit of a prerequisite for like really training the deadlift heavy. Because again, working on the core stuff, standing plank, carries, they've owned this position. They've owned the standing position under load. Now, we're just gonna hammer on picking that load off the ground. So, fortunately or unfortunately, when you're lifting you know, a single kettlebell, you know, you're doing it in a sumo deadlift fashion. You, you don't really conventional deadlift kettlebells unless you, know, you have two, but that's a whole nother story. But very, very user friendly because the weight is centered directly up underneath somebody's grip. You don't have the weight way out here like you do on a barbell. So everything is right up under you, all right? So it's easier to teach, easier to learn. So when somebody's uh, deadlifting for the first time or every other time after their first time, <laughs> stand directly over the bell such that the handle is approximately in line with the ankle bone or back of the heel. You don't necessarily want to deadlift like a barbell out in front of you it's not necessary because putting extra leverage on the back. So take advantage of the design of the kettlebell to stand directly over top of it. Grab a holds. And you know, when you're here, obviously you guys know, cue a straight back, cue the lats. And what you can try here is think about pulling the handle apart like this. And guess what? your upper back automatically engages. From there, midfoot balance. Make sure people aren't way up onto the heels. Make sure they're not posting up onto the toes. Midfoot balance, tripod balance, if you guys are familiar, big toe, little toe, heel. Make sure that that's an even distribution of weight and tension. From there, squeeze and stand. We're gonna come down exactly the same way we came up. Push the hip back, set the bell right back down where you found it, and stand. So the main thing that we see in the deadlift is 
not respecting that midfoot balance, and not respecting engagement of the upper body. If you don't have your lats on, then tricky things can happen with the spine, as we know. So let's pop up and let's just try a set of, uh, we'll say six, six deadlifts. And I realize that these weights are probably not gonna be that challenging for you, but I want you to pretend like they are. Okay, so let's try six reps. <laughs> and just keep a lot of those cues in mind. Breaking the handle, setting the weight down between the ankles, standing up nice and tall. Yep. And you'll even notice on your way up, maybe your lockout and on your way down, you might come off your toes. Try to actively grip the ground with your toes. Simple enough, right guys? And the deadlift is a huge rabbit hole that we could go down, but like I said, you can clear up like 80% of problems by making sure, it's not like a broken record, that your student has that midfoot balance and that they're actively engaged through the lats. Right? So I, I understand that engaging the lats is easier said than done for a lot of people. Um, ideally, you should kind of get to the point where you can flex your lat and have it like cramp in the same kind of way that you could do your bicep. You know what I mean? If you squeeze your bicep hard enough, just right here, you can probably feel it start to cramp up because of how much neuromuscular juice you have flowing to that muscle. You should be able to do the same thing with your lat. So don't want to spend too much time there because I think you guys all get the idea. Any particular questions with the deadlift? One thing that um, when I'm, when I, first start teaching people this because this is what we usually show them you know show our students first before we take them into the kettlebell swing is it's you know they'll tend to squat it a lot of times so they have it they're ready to go they're ready to do it and then I see them come down and come up so it's really making sure I tell them to make sure that they feel it in their hamstrings that that's where they want to hear it because if they sit back and really do it all of yours look good so um, if they sit back then they'll feel it here. So I just try to give them that just so they know, because it's hard to say, just don't squat it. And they, they don't know what I mean. And you know, I, so sometimes I'll even take the hand and like chop back and try to get them used to that hinging motion. But if they feel it, if they do it correctly and they go down, they're gonna feel it back there. And so that's just something that I mention when I'm doing it, um, because it is sometimes a hard concept for them to get um, when we're teaching them the hinge. Yeah. So, yeah, just a couple other kind of small things on the deadlift. I mean, one, in the interest of like scaling, anytime someone's having trouble with swings, cleans, any other sort of like ballistic hip dominant kettlebell lift, take them back to the deadlift. Just have them practice the hip hinge. I'm also a big fan of single arm deadlifts. Let's actually try that. You guys remember where single arm? Not with the deadlift. Yeah. Try that, same thing, for a set of six on each side. And what I want you to think about is flexing your pec on that side, on that loaded side. Okay? Keeping the shoulders square. You know, we talk, we talk about the lat so much, oftentimes we forget that the pec is also connected there to the shoulder. So the more we can get the pec and the lat squeezing together to help stabilize that shoulder and that arm, the better. And again, just like how Tracy said, make sure that you and your students are feeling this in the hamstrings, you know, not too much into a squatting type motion. Another way that you can kind of help people feel out the difference between an hinge and a squat is what I call the deadlift float. So if you cue somebody up with you know, all those points of tension, and then you just have them float the weight, not actually lift it all the way, but float it just a couple inches off the ground, and holds. 
Now what you'll find is people instinctively want to start rocking back to their heels or losing the shoulders or losing the core. So that's another good isometric to help people get into their good wedge. Right? And then if somebody can hold here for 10, 15 seconds, they've owned the bottom position. Then you can tell them to stay. Let's try that. Let's try that two times. Just float your deadlift a couple inches off the ground for five seconds or so. Keep your lats. How's everybody's back feel? Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. It might be. I feel it all up here, so we're yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. So again, as a coach, this will help you cue back angles. You know, cueing, cueing your setup unloaded may not really translate well to the actual lift. So when you actually do the deadlift float, you can, you can say, you know, maybe tuck the tailbone a little bit if your client is super arched. Maybe you can tell them to arch the back a little bit if they're super flexed. Same thing with head position. I mean, in general, we just we know that all else being equal, let's just keep it neutral. But if somebody's super tucked or super extended, we can get them to do the deadlift float and easily cue them into a better position. Because they're under load, it'll stick better. And then when you can combine that with your actual deadlift sets and reps. So maybe, maybe a set of two or three deadlift float, maybe even like with a lighter weight, and say, OK, shake it out. Now let's go to this heavier weight, set of five, set of 10, what have you. So you can mix and match these things. You can mix and match the skills with the drills, the drills with the lifts, to help all this stuff marinate for your client. Cool? cool. All right, simple as that. So when your client has mastered the hip hinge, right? So they got this good hinge without squatting, without rounding the back, without anything weird with the neck or breathing or anything like that, then we can add speed and ballisticness to the deadlift, which equals the kettlebell swing. So Tracy, let yep. us know. And so that, you know, they've learned their hinge, so they, they should at least have the, you know, the setup. The difference with the swing, and one thing I do want to emphasize with the swing, because I'll see people um, do their swings and they just, you know, pick, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to get hurt. Just pick up the bell and just start swinging. And one thing that we try to emphasize is that the setup from the ground is as, in, and putting it back down, is just as important, um, if not more, than the swing itself because you know when people are doing the swing if you just you know finish your swing put it down that's you know where they risk getting hurt because they kind of lose their tension and sit it down it also sets you up for really strong swings um, so i'm just going to kind of describe what i'm doing and then we'll break it down and go through um, we do the hard style the russian hard style swing so when we swing we swing up to about 90 degrees um, we don't go above that Sometimes we do go below it, it's fine. When you have a heavier bell, you're letting your hips and your legs drive the bell up. So that's another thing when I'm coaching it or when we're teaching that. A lot of people, if you'll see when the first time, the swing is a hard thing initially for people to grasp, but once they do, it's incredibly powerful. And, um, they'll, but they'll try to use their hands to pull it up. So we try to make sure they understand. It is a full body exercise, but it's your glutes and your legs that are driving the bell up. And so as far as much power as you have, that's where it's gonna stop. So if it's here, it's fine. Um, so when I set up, I set up again, kind of in my you know, feet about shoulder width apart. You don't wanna be too wide or too narrow. Um, I set it up in like, I guess a good example is, is I'm going to hike a, hike a ball. So I get down like I'm going to hike a ball. So I sit, sit back and I grab my bell, I usually have it a little bit in front of me to where I can reach it comfortably. And I tilt it towards me, bring my lats back, 
and this is the drive so the hike you know I'm loaded have my tripod feet my feet are really rooted in the ground hips are back and I'm gonna hike it in and then swing and then I bring it back and sit it so when I swing it back through I sit it so I start from the floor bring it through and let it sit on the floor um, when I take my breath I'm breathing in and then exhaling out breathing in through my belly but my top position when I'm at the top it's a, as we, we went through before it's a plank so I'm I squeeze my glutes really hard and of course when the bell gets heavier I'm trying to really use to have a lot of power come through um, come through bring it up and then at the top position I'm tight shoulders back lats engaged um, and uh, anyway so like I'm <laughs> losing my track of thought uh, okay so okay so that is this right here is called a power swing it's a dead swing it's often what we teach people when we're teaching the swing initially one swing at a time so that way they can kind of get familiar with the beginning to the end before we start having them do reps um, from a programming standpoint a lot of times we will do uh, it's one of my um, favorite things to do is I'll do like five power swings and then five dead swings and then run into sets of swings but I want to have you all, I want to see what your swings are. So I'm going to have you set up and do one. And I'm kind of going to walk around and give you cues. But we're going to start with just doing a couple of the power swings. So think again, really sitting back, lats back. Oh, with your gaze. That's, so when you're gazing forward, you don't want to have your head down. You don't want to have it head up. You want to have neutral. I usually pick a point kind of like on the horizon and look. And if you watch, I'll keep my eyes there the whole time. And I have, head, you think at the top, head high. Now when you're teaching it, there's so many cues. As I'm just running through now, I'm going, you know, sit back, tighten, keep your feet flat, keep your lats back, breathe. It's very confusing when you're, when you're doing that. So, you, so generally, I will start with um, trying to make them use their, use the hips for the power and focus on that. Sit back, use your hips. Don't use your arms, use your hips. So. Let me go ahead and have you all do um, a couple of the power swings. So just single swings, maybe three or four, just so I can kind of watch. And Perfect. Nice. 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 Really nice. Standing up tall, toes grip the ground. Yep. Oh, and one thing that I didn't mention, you all are doing it just naturally, but when we're teaching again, the, the idea is to keep the bell in like the top triangle, because another thing that I will see people do is round over. So when they do their swings, they're rounding over. So as long as their shoulders are back, making sure that they understand they want to stay, stay tall, but when they're um, bringing the bell through to keep it high, to keep it like in this triangle. So that way, which you all did, so that way when they're reaching back, they get power, bring it up, reaching back. Now, one thing that, um, that I also try to do as far as explaining this when we're doing a barbell deadlift, when I'm teaching people a barbell deadlift, I will often have them do um, kettlebell swings because if you look, which you all do, I assume you all do barbell deadlifts as well, so when I'm down here, you know, again, I guess I'm not into, I'm conventional. So, but at the top, it's like, tch. so I try to associate them when they're doing their deadlift, tch. that whole, you know, hip hinge and locking out at the top. I think kettlebells carry over tremendously to that, especially heavy kettlebells will carry over um, a lot to that. So now let's go ahead and do um, maybe just like five, five to 10 regular swings um, without the dead stop. And this time, what I want you to think about is breathing because it was silent when you were swinging. <laughs> so think of um, breathing, and you don't have to make that like I do. That's, you know, I've, I've always done that with the, heart, the diaphragmatic breathing. You can breathe through your nose, but make sure you breathe. 
breathe in going down, out when you come up. So I'll just do it with just my nose. With now. So when I'm doing that, I tighten just as if somebody's going to punch me in the stomach. So it's that, that plank at the top. But when I do that, it's very much, um, it, it uh, gives me an incredible amount of power at the top of my swing. So this time I want you to breathe, breathe in and breathe out. So that way you're not holding your breath. So I at least hear some breathing. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Yeah, your swings all have a lot of power, so. Is there another cue that you give? Because I when we teach, we teach yes. wheel swing on day one in foundations. And yep. that's the number one thing is keeping them from, I'll say, you know, keep the kettlebell above the knees. Right. Like, don't let it drop wrist below the kneecaps. That helps. But then when they do that, they their chest does something really yeah. weird. And so I'm like, you got to get the kettlebell just behind your butt. So one, <laughs> one cue that I really like to help teach them, because, again, I can say it over and over again, and they're going to want to use their hands to bring it up. They space. don't know. So <laughs> I'm going to have you do, I'll have you do this, okay. and I'll do so, and again, be careful when you do this, but what she'll do is she's gonna swing and I'm going to just, to, I'm gonna say, you just get up there at the top and then you'll go when I, it's cueing the timing because with the timing, you're up here at your 90 degrees and immediately they're just starting to go and they kind of, you know, lose their, what they're doing, they're not thinking about it. So to help them, I tell them, you just wait and I'll push when you're ready to go. So I get in front and I push the bell just to get them used to it. And then I'm like, then you bring it back up as quickly as you can and then I'll push it again. It just seems to really help with the timing and getting them, and their swings almost instantly get better with okay, that. Cool. So I'm gonna have you do it. So, so you that, I'll get here and you'll push it down? Yep, okay. yep, so you, so I'll let, I'll let you do one first and then I'll start. Oh yeah, I do kind of feel that. So it kind of forces the... Yes. Gotcha. Yes. So that's just a way of helping them know when to, you know, now I'm going to say, you send it back. Now you got to be careful. Obviously you don't yeah, want well, people. I think the big yeah. thing they don't, they're not using their hips and they're just trying right. to pull. So that actually helps them kind of think like a pendulum, like it does cause, and keep their hips where they are. Yes. Cause one of the, I will watch squat. and they'll want to squat and they will want to use their arms and they don't, I'll say, use your hips, use your hips. And so something like that really helps them. Like it, it forces them to use it. And usually once they can kind of get used to that, I also tell them just to squeeze their hips as hard as they can. And some of it, it just takes practice and getting time. But that initial, just trying to get them away from, yeah. because it does. At first, it's, you know, with everybody, it's, um, it's a challenging move. But then once they get it and they understand the power, it also, you know, puts a lot of power into it. So do you have any? You have... Uh, you guys, your, your, your swings, swings look great. Look, look really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, keep the rooted foot idea top of mind. Yeah. <clears throat> because I like to think that anytime you're doing any exercise standing, you are firstly doing a foot exercise. Because that's where you're actually making contact with planet Earth, right? So. You can have the best spinal mechanics and hip drive and all that other stuff, but if you are teeter-tottering on your feet, you're, you're, you're literally lifting on shaky ground. Yeah. So kind of the point of the whole, uh, of really all weightlifting, but especially squats and uh, hinges, is navigating your body around that midfoot because you are using the stability of the ground to help lift the weight, to help push yourself. We've all heard the uh, saying, you know, you can't fire a cannon from a canoe, right? So it's like you wouldn't deadlift on a waterbed. So weightlifting is really all about how you're transferring force through the ground, through the immovable object of the planet so that you can lift the weight, swing the weight, etc. So it's a, it's a very subtle point, uh, but if you don't keep that top of mind, you will soon find yourself teeter-tottering yeah. on your feet. Yep. So just keep that in mind. The partner 
the partner eccentric swing is a huge one. Huge. I, I would probably, uh, once somebody gets their deadlift and they start getting into the swing, if there is even the slightest inkling that they are using their arms, get to the side of them and throw that, throw that bell back down. It seems scary at first, but it I just helps. say don't let go of the bell. <laughs> don't let go. Right. That's why you stand off to the side. Now, uh, and one other quick thing, which I don't think is the case with any of you guys, but you will see with a lot of people, they hyperextend and they lean back. It could be as simple as if somebody's got a good deadlift, cue them back into that deadlift. Yeah. Cue them back into that plank situation. You could also just take a clipboard or a foam roller and if somebody's swinging, just hold right here at their back and you say, if you touch my hand, you're leaning back. You can also, if you're in a class setting, you can also run resistance bands around a rack and you can have someone stand so that they're lightly touching the resistance band. And you can say, okay, now take an inch step forward. Okay, now set up for your swing. Boom, if you touch that band, you're leaning back. Does that make sense? That's, that's the other big thing that we see. So crown of the head nice and high, rooting through the feet, high triangle. And now, now you're making a monster. Yep, and then w from a programming standpoint, as you know, there's so much you can do with swings. You can do single arm swings, you can do hand-to-hand -hand swings, you can do every minute on the minute, every 30 seconds, and I mean, I love all the different variations of um, swings, and that can definitely, you know, um, great finishers. In five minutes, yeah. you can, you know, five, six minutes, you can do a lot, so. Yeah. Any questions on the swing? So you're teaching a brand new person, they're in here, we teach the swing on day one. Um, they want to know why. What do you say? How do you, yeah, I was going to say. It's in a, layman's terms. Yeah, so for me, it's, it's one of the best full body exercise. It will work everything. If, they want to, if people ask me, what do you do to watch, work your core swings? What do you do to work your butt? Here's the best thing, you know, for me, I, I was telling Zach this just, just last night. I said, I still remember the very first day that I went in and I learned the swing. And we did learn the swing. I learned the, the deadlift and then the swing on my very first day. And I remember the next day, I felt everything, everywhere more than I ever have with any other, other exercise. And it, so it gives you both strength, you gain strength and you gain conditioning, so it's both. So it's not just, it's, you know, you're getting um, everything from that. So it's, uh, um, it's, yeah, your general fitness and strength. And you can keep getting, you know, heavier bells, it'll carry through. So if you have someone, let's say you have someone who is already, maybe they're new to the swing, but they're not new to de barbell work or barbell deadlifts, that swing will ca absolutely carry over to through their barbell deadlifts. So, um, but yeah, that's, yeah, but it's full body. So it'll work everything for them. It's yeah. one of the best. Again, speaking to like the lay person, why should I do the swing? It, it probably should be almost the same elevator pitch that you would give for why would you do CrossFit? You want to get in the best shape of your life? This is what you should be doing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and it's a staple. It's, you know, just like carries, I would say the swing is a staple. Um, it keeps me, because again, when lifts start, when, when my lifts do start getting a lot heavier, I'm resting a lot more. I still want to keep my general fitness up. I still want to, you know, keep my work capacity up. So I'll keep, I'll always keep kettlebell swing, kettlebell snatch, um, just to still get the conditioning that I need to get. So I like that. And I can gain, you can grip strength. You can get, you know, you start getting with heavier bells, doing single arms. Your, I mean, your grip strength will uh, go up exponentially. So. Yep. Good question. Right on, guys. Anything else that we've covered? Questions about what we've covered so far? Core stuff, hinge, hinge stuff. Do you guys want to take a three to five minute break, or do you want to roll into squats? Anyone got pee? No. <laughs> I was gonna say because this is when you should. Yeah. Before squats. <laughs> Will you talk about the snatch at all today? Uh, 
We can. It's not on the menu, but we can. Yeah, we'll talk about whatever you want. I just feel like that. We do them occasionally, but okay. people get it so messed up. Because yeah. the dumbbell snatch is kind of taking center stage and CrossFit. Yeah. You give them a kettlebell and they just screw it up. Yeah. But only if there's time and if you're cool with it. Well, one thing is, I'll, I'll, I'll give my guy Connor here behind the camera a big, you know, big ups. We just filmed a in-depth video on the kettlebell snatch two weeks ago. Uh, that I don't know if I could tell you anything that isn't already in that video, but the, the snatch is 90% swing. So you need somebody's, you need, if somebody's gonna snatch 12, 12 kilo, they need to be one arm swinging twice that, like cake. You know what I mean? Because there's, there's a certain, I'm actually working on a little article about this, of how, as a coach, you can see how people own one weight as a way to gauge if they're ready for the next advanced lift at the next type of weight. So your first, I would say your first kind of goal as a coach would be to get man or woman swinging a solid 24 kilo one armed like solid back swing solid lockout solid uh you know chest height swing good breathing good power for probably you know maybe five sets of 10 somewhere around that 50 total repetition mark before i would say okay this person is ready to go overhead um but in, in the interest of like progressions, I like to, I like to teach a, um, I just call it a high swing. You'll actually see exercises that are like high pulls. I don't really get into those too much, but the high swing kind of looks like a high pull in the sense that what you're doing is instead of projecting the weight out, you're projecting it up and you're keeping it close. That's the fundamental difference between a swing and a snatch. The hip is the same, but the arm isn't. Because with a snatch, you wanna transfer that hip power vertical. With a swing, you're transferring it horizontal. So I like to do this high swing, which basically looks like this. See how I'm keeping it in the midline? and I'm bending my elbow, and I'm letting it float right over my head. From there, I punch, and the snatch happens. Do you guys want to try that? With a, with a super lightweight? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say, get a lightweight. <laughs> I like that high swing thing. I could even see just using that as the movement yeah. for a lot of people. For yeah. sure. Like just stop there. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Can I steal that one? Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> well, and the snatches I like because for people that do get more advanced, they really like to be able to. Oh yeah, Every, everybody loves to snatch a kettlebell. Yep. It's fun. Yeah, see that's it. Yeah, Good that's tall awesome. posture. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, stay tall. It, and it eyes whacks up. there because yeah. it's hard. It yeah. just takes the. It's hard well, for them to understand the. Keep your eyes up. Right. And you gotta let go. Yep. They're like so we hold on for dear life. Usually <laughs> we'll have people for a long time doing something like that yeah. just to progress, yeah. and then eventually yeah. then they'll get used yeah. to it. Yeah. I like the. High That's what I like to hear. We learn something. We can all go home. And then you come down. First. Well, so that that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She said. Casey's been yeah. putting around her wrist for about seven months. So. <laughs> nice. Keep your eyes up. Yep. I'm so like, no. Nice. <laughs> Smooth. Looks really good. <laughs> now. So that that's great. So is that helpful? Yes. Just just practicing the high swing. I like to imagine, so like if I'm setting up in line with this beam right here, I like to imagine whenever I'm doing single arm kettlebell work that my thumb travels an imaginary red line directly down the center of my vision, right? Because what a lot of people will do with single arm work is they travel off that line and they end up out here. And then just weird stuff happens. 
But remember how I said you want to flex that pec with your single arm deadlift? Flex that pec in all of your single arm kettlebell work. That will help <coughs> immensely, immensely. So the high, you, you, you kind of, you're a little bit loose up here. You don't want to be death gripping the bell. You don't want to be tight. You want to be loose so that you can punch through. Now, for a progression, pull the weight down to the rack position under slow control, then put it back down to the ground or back in your backswing. If it's somebody's first time, don't have them, whoa, hit their first snatch, and then go all the way back down into it. Snap city. Yank their back, all that other stuff, and you know, blasting off the shoulder. Ha -uh. Keep them tight. Got it? Then, once they own that, another, another thing that I like to do <clears throat> is then just practice the drop. So then just have somebody clean and press, and then practice the snatch drop. Clean, press, drop. Does that make sense? The, 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 uh, the snatch drop is more dangerous than the snatch up. It's, it's where everybody loses their back position. It's where people lose the back swing, where people pinch calluses. So that's, that's kind of a whole like another series of like learning how to catch a bell on the way down. But you can easily practice that idea from the rack position. So if we know that when we lock out a kettlebell, the bell's in the heel of the hand, but when it goes into the backswing, we want it into the fingers. So there's a, whole, there's a whole line of practice around catching it into the fingers. Do you see that? See how I just let it drop? It's a free fall, and I just catch it into my fingers. So practice there from the shoulder, then practice from overhead. A couple other things. This is just one man's opinion. When you're swinging, snatching, doing any sort of hinge work, especially ballistic, keep your eyes forward. Yeah. On the concentric and on the eccentric. Tends to be especially for very strong, very powerful people. You like to tuck your chin and stare at the ground like you're mad at it. And I get it, but if you can get your eyes up, create space in the shoulders, you, if, you ever have to, if you ever have to do like an endurance-based event with snatches, ask us how we know. Two days ago. <laughs> you're gonna have an easy time breathing yeah. and managing your fatigue if you're here, you're breathing here, as opposed to like this. Again, do your thing, but that's, that's just the way that I like, to, uh, I like to look at it, because we also know that the body follows the eyes. The head follows the eyes, the body follows the head. So if you want a good standing lockout, look forward or maybe even look slightly up. Another big thing that we see in swings and snatches is on the way down, people look down. And then the bell yanks them down. Yeah. If you can do like what Tracy said and just pick a spot so that when you're at your backswing, you're slightly up, and at the top, you're neutral, then that means that at the bottom, you're already biased to come up. And when you're coming down, you're biased to kind of stay neutral. Does that, does that make sense? That's another big rabbit hole is like eye position, but yeah. I think you guys get the idea. For those that have maybe never heard of kettlebell competition, can you tell us what that endurance event is that you're referencing? <laughs> so Mine is, yeah, it's for, it's kettlebell for the instructor certification. It's, we have to do a five minute snatch test. So we have to do a hundred 
um, snatches for, with the 16K for women for our weight class and for the men it's the 24K. And so you have five minutes and you have to, and they have to be perfect, locked out. They'll give you no count if it's not a perfect rep. And um, as far as locking out the top. So he practiced time, it practiced the breathing. And the first 40, it's like, oh, this is easy. You it's, you can put it down. Yeah, you can put it down. You can do. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can put it down. No, no, no. You can put it down. So I normally and everybody comes up with their own like little way of doing it. I usually do like 10 on each side. Some people count it different. It doesn't matter how you get it. As long as by five minutes it's done. So I do. I'll do 10, 10 and I go up to 60 without putting it down. And then I put it down, rest, think I'm going to die. And then I do. Then I'll do the other 20, 10, 10 and then do it. And usually I finish about four minutes, 40 seconds, almost every time, because I do it the same way every yeah. time. And so, but the breathing, but it's like, it's like by the end. Like rest an extra like yeah. 10 seconds on each put down, you're like 20 seconds over. And by the end, by the time I rest, and I don't really want to pick it up again. I'm like, I don't want to keep going. And so, but it's, it's, um, and at the end, what I find is where, this is where your hip power draw, comes in so much because with a snatch, that power is what gets it up there. Yeah. So I start getting tired and I'm like, oh, come on. And you know, put it in there. So, but it's good. It's, I love it. And I love doing like, you know, every minute on the minute. I like doing, even in my own practice, sometimes I'll do, you know, like at the top of every 30 seconds, I'll do 10 right. And then at the bottom 30 seconds, I'll do 10 left and I'll just kind of, you know, do that with a lighter bell or I'll do, you know, six or seven or something like that for a longer amount of time. So, but to train for it, which is good to train for it, I don't want to do, do a whole lot of snatches because it will start tearing up your hands. So what I did to, to train for it was I was doing one arm swings with the 20 or the 24 K. Um, I was doing 105 minutes to get ready for it. So it's not quite. And then when I go to take my 16 for the snatches, it's like, okay, this isn't better. as bad. Yeah, it does feel better. And it helps, helps train that. I had the same endurance training, yeah. but yet um, it wasn't as taxing on yeah. my hands. Cause the snatches do start, you know, will start taking your, yeah. <laughs> and humidity and all that kind of factors in, so. But one other thing with the snatches, what I was going to say again, because I was really, I had to go through all the skills and tech, you know, tests as well. And so I wanted to look right. One thing with the snatch that I often have to use as a cue is to make sure they keep it close. Because I will see them like bringing it up, bringing it down, keeping that, that snatch close. That is what often helps where you're talking about where they come over and yeah, just whack the wrist. wrist. I, again, there's going to be some of that initially just it, it's a it's a skill so it'll take a while for them to get used to it but keeping that close and keeping it in the middle because sometimes again if I get tired you know I might find it drifting out here of course then it starts going all over the place so using that hip power keeping it in the middle and letting it stay close coming up and you know com then coming down dropping it not dropping it out like that so those cues help a whole lot for myself as well and I'll film I'll film and watch it and I'm like oh so that helps kind of see just to make sure that that it's going in the right right on guys great question thanks for bringing it up hopefully that helps all right so now we're moving on into the squat so again <clears throat> what we kind of wanted to think about with the curriculum here is picking out a few of the key moves and exercises that would kind of help like span the spectrum of what each individual pattern like represents from a training standpoint. So when we're talking about the squat, we've got the goblet squat, which is a free weight front squat that's dynamite for teaching and for mobility. And then we have the back squat, which is is kind of on the other side of the spectrum. It's typically heavy, it's typically obviously loaded on your back, and it has a whole other set of criterion for programming purposes. So is everybody familiar with the goblet squat? Like, like straight out, cool. So I really like to use the goblet squat as the way to teach people uh, good squat mechanics after you've obviously already done like your body weight squat, all right? So, but even if somebody has a little bit of a tricky body weight squat, um, typically a goblet squat will help clean things up, okay? So, how do we do it? I like to grip by the horns, hold out about six to eight inches away from the chest, 
Do not rest on the chest. Bring it out. Give it a little bit of squeeze. Literally squeeze the handle, but also squeeze in like an isometric pec deck. You feel me? We want to get as much upper body engagement as possible. So squeeze in like a pec deck. You're holding out. Eyes neutral. Fall directly down to where the elbows ideally meet the insides of the knees. You can rest them there a little bit, but when you're ready to come up, bring them in. Squeeze and stand. Let's knock out a set of six. You don't need anything too heavy. Can I borrow that one? Please. So guess what you should be doing with your feet? Keeping tripod balance. Yes. Keeping midfoot balance. I anticipate you guys all have pretty good squats. Yeah. And yeah, no, no problems here. Nice. Cool, guys. So just from a teaching perspective, this will, again, when you're, when you're cueing the pec deck, when you're cueing the squeeze, we want to turn like every exercise into as much of a full body exercise as possible. If you really want to get strong, every exercise involves every muscle group. Otherwise, you're leaving strength on the table. Every muscle needs to have a job to do something, you know? Not just for the sake of artificially making an exercise harder, but so that you can, you know, develop the athletic quality of tension and directing tension into different muscle groups. So, you got somebody who's knocking out great goblet squats. Obviously, from a mobility standpoint, once they're at the bottom, you can do the prying motion, which is push out against one knee, stretch the groin side, push the knee out, stretch that groin side, square back up. You don't even, I mean, going ass to grass is fine. If somebody has super duper mobility here, I actually like to tell them to stay up. two inches higher. It's harder. Because that's harder. This is slack. This is tension. A couple curls. These are fun. Elbows in and stand. So let's try one set of those. Come down, stretch the adductors on one side, stretch the adductors on the other side. No slack. Mark. No slack. <laughs> I think it's harder. <laughs> and then do like three curls, which will probably be a little bit easier than you anticipate. Yeah, and I like and doing these prying squats for warm up. They're really good for warming up before you do the workout. Mark, limit yourself to 10. <laughs> <laughs> limit yourself to 10. Yes. Curls are the cool best. Cool guys. <laughs> so, hey, the goblet <laughs> squat, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. But this is another example of just an exercise that you can throw in anywhere and everywhere. Hey, if you're doing, if you're doing a big upper body day, push-ups, pull-ups, whatnot, throw in some goblet squats. You know, there, there's no reason that your clients or your athletes should come into the gym and turn off half of their body, right? So I always love to sneak in lower body moves on upper body training days and vice versa. And the goblet squat is like Great. number one in that regard. So, simple as that. Any questions on the goblet squat? So, Trace is going to lead us squat. through back. a little bit of the back squat, yep. which is obviously one third of the powerlifting competition. So, in the interest of, you know, if you really want to get Bull strong, if you have any inkling for powerlifting competition, um, this is where you really need to pay attention. Yeah, so with the back squat, just like with the swings, I'm gonna focus, focus probably most of the time on the setup. Um, the way I look at the setup to me is um, one of the most important, important parts of the lift. It is what basically sets you up for a strong lift. And I can tell when I unrack the weight when I stand up with the weight how that weight's going to feel and so there's ways you can do a lot of people just go up put it on their bar walk back I mean I look at Zach and I were talking I was looking at my videos from when I first started and that's exactly what I did and probably one of the things that has helped me the most is learning how to 
get that brace and get up with the bar. So I'm just gonna kind of quickly go through this, the steps um, and then we'll kind of do it. We have some of the bars set up. So what I do is for stance, and I'll just describe this before I um, turn around since I'll be kind of looking this way. I, um, the stance, I, you can be, wide stance is fine, narrow stance is fine, but I generally tell people to start with just shoulder width, just like what you would do for your goblet squat to, to stand there. Um, my stance is pretty narrow, um, but if you watch, you'll see people, you know, stand wide. It's not right or wrong. It's whatever you feel the strongest with and what your students feel the strongest with. So, but I always generally tell people when they're starting, just start with a shoulder width stance. Same thing with high bar, low bar. I use, you know, I train with both. Um, it doesn't matter. It's where they can feel the strongest, where they can be the most comfortable. If they're not, you know, if you're training for a powerlifting competition, yeah, try, probably try to go low because you can generally, you know, get more weight on, handle more weight. There's plenty of people that do it with high bar as well. So you want to have, um, have it on the, have the bar on the shelf at where you're going to be the strongest. As far as grip, you want, again, you want to have the grip as close as you can be um, with good form, with good, you know, it depends on what the range of motion and what their flexibility will allow. And then from that, you know, as people get stronger and they get more advanced, it's wherever they feel the most comfortable and wherever they feel the strongest. There's not a right or wrong way. You may hear some people say there is, it's really not. But the goal really is to try to stay because if you're arms are close, if your grip is close, it's going to force your back to stay tight. You're going to be able to maintain that tightness better than where if you're out here, it's kind of, you're, it's harder to maintain that tightness. So when I grip, when I grip the bar, I will grip it right kind of at the edge of the knurling. And I set back, I grab it, I come through, set the bar, and then I get under the bar. This is one of the things that is the most, you know, important people will come up because you want to have that stability and you want to have that tension. I tighten my back and I take a breath here. I take my time and take a breath and then stand up. And then the step, the walkout, you want to be as close to the bar as you can, but you want to be, um, you know, take the fewest amount of steps. I say three steps max. So one, to get back from the bar so I don't hit the bar straight back. My first step is to set my position. Second step is to set my position. And again, you can adjust if you need to, but I just you know, do three steps. I'm holding my grip tight. Now I'm squeezing my lats. I let the bar settle. I take a breath and brace. and then I walk up and rest straight up. So um, the, the, as the part of the setup that, I'm, that I consider the most important um, is when you're getting ready to stand up with the weight. So I, will, I can find that the lighter I can, I practice in my training trying to make that bar as light as I can when I stand up. And the better that I brace, the better I'll stand up and, you know, and confidence wise and just knowing that I'm bracing and doing what I need to do. So I take that breath, stand up, take my one step and it's straight back so that, because again, if I just take, some people will take two steps, it's fine as well, but then you, you a lot of times you'll hit the rack. So if you go straight back, you're getting away from the bar, one to set, two to set, I guess I could be on that side, hold it, hold my, you know, Take my um, breath, brace as if somebody's going to punch me, and then, and then just walk straight up and, and slam the you know, rack. As far as breathing, a lot of times, you know, if, the, if it's lighter, again, it's preference. Um, when weights get really heavy, I will hold my breath the entire time. But you definitely want to hold it and brace on the way down. Some people, you can, you, as long as you're letting it out, not just letting all your air out, you can do the diaphragmatic breathing where you're down and let it out. So you can kind of feel that. I will hold my breath the whole time. But for the setup, so what I want to have you do is we have all the, I just put the bars, we can put weights on it, but mainly it's just to kind of get a feel for the setup 
Um, and then, you know, so you can kind of go through and get a feel for, and I can look at your positioning and see where you are with that. So are you all, I'm assuming you all do probably lots of back squats, so. <laughs> but with training it, with coaching it, I try to spend a lot of time on the setup with them because the squat obviously is what you're doing is the motion it is important but there's so much with the taking your time if you rush it it always will feel heavier and I've been able some of the best um, gains that I've been able to make with the squat have been solely from my from taking my time on my setup and taking the breath and maintaining that the other thing that I was going to say is a lot of people from a cue standpoint will say you know chest up which obviously you want your chest up but that, when you're down there, it's like chest up, I'm trying. So what I will tell people often is that kind of will reiterate that, but in a way that gives them an action to do is to focus on the upper back tightness. Focus on squeezing the bar and really tightening your back. Because when I do that, by default, my chest comes up. So that's just a, a natural cue. Because again, telling somebody to do something when they have more weight on the bar, it's just you know, it's, that's a cue that they can kind of understand and that they can actively do. So if we want to, just go ahead, we can get to the, I'll leave this on here with the bars and I'll... And, the, and you can use this one too. I have weights on it. So you, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's 95 pounds. <laughs> So then you'll take a breath and then squeeze your butt and stand up. Yep. And then slide one back. Yep. Perfect. And then you can go ahead and nice. Nice. Oh, yep. <laughs> I was like so good until I had to bring it back in. <laughs> cool guys does anybody have any specific questions yeah, on back this. squat technique or yeah. programming or anything of the sort Right. I, uh, the biggest thing I talk about before you even squat is like grip on the bar and yep. how important your back is. How would you like explain to them why that's important? Because a new person thinking back squats, they're thinking, okay, cool, I'm gonna work my legs. They're just like, and I have bigger dudes in my classes that like we have like 40, the 40 year old range that we used to do back squats when they were back in high school, and so now they do the back squats wide like this, and they have the loosest grip ever. Yeah. And I'm like, you can lift so much more weight if you're just like a yeah. little bit tighter in between. So how would you explain to like a new person the importance of like, I guess your upper mid core area? Yeah. I like to say whenever you're lifting heavy weight, especially barbells, what you want to think about is not lifting the weight, but rather absorbing the weight into your skeleton. When you get set up just right, and Tracy can tell you, if you set up tight as a tick on that uh, barbell and you step out, you don't even feel it. You do not even feel the bar. All yeah. you feel is you're, you're tight. And, and then when you do your squat, you're not, you're not even feeling like you're squatting a weight on your back. You're just feeling like your bones are heavy. That's how you know that You've you're doing it right. It right. Yep. And that is the only way that you're gonna squat twice body weight, Nobody, nobody is going to teeter totter twice body weight on their shoulders and do a full range of motion squat and not bust something, not blow a gasket. Unless you are so engaged that you don't even feel that there's anything on your back, you just feel like you're suddenly 250 pounds heavier and you're just squatting yourself. That is the secret of a great setup. That goes in your deadlift, that goes in your bench yeah, press okay. too. That goes in all yeah. of your major heavy power lifting style lifts. Yeah, and I can tell, you know, if I'll do a, a heavy single sometimes and I do everything just right because it's 
heavy. And then I go back to back down. I'm like, oh, this is going to be light. And I stand up and I put it back immediately because I know I'm not treating it. So I try to even treat from my first warm up all the way up to the heaviest lift same the setup. same. Because at one, it's repetition, repetition, repetition. You get used to just doing that every time and it becomes more natural. But two, I can tell a difference. Because if, I, if you stand up and that weight feels heavy, you're gonna go into that thinking, you're gonna you know, do things, you may not go as low in depth, you may not, you know, you're just gonna know this, this doesn't feel good, this may not go well. But if you stand up and you're right before you unrack it and it feels light and you know, you've done everything right, then you're gonna go into that with confidence, plus you're doing everything right. So it is gonna go better and it is gonna be stronger. So really the answer is, you know, if they want to get stronger and really lift more weight, then doing that and doing everything that they can to maximize their tension is gonna make all the difference in the world. And that's just practice, practice, practice doing it. And if they're doing it as a skill. What would, and, what would be like a cue for them to do that? Like, because. For new people, I just yep. tell them, you know, full grip on the bar because everybody wants to roll it back yeah. and then they create that arch and creating, yep. you know, you want elbows pointed down mostly to the ground or back a little bit. And then sometimes you see the elbows come up this way. So it will be like a good cue for like a new person. I'll say, you know, I will say to keep the back tight, you know, tighten your lats, keep your, keep your back tight. And sometimes I'll go back and like touch their back, mm -hmm. say, you know, tighten it up, tighten it up. Um, or and make sure you know they have their grip just so they can kind of kind of feel that. Um, yeah. Well, hey, if with their permission, oh, get pump. get handsy with them. Yeah. Okay. So set up on the bar. Yep. Tactile. Tactile cues. So from here, you say, "All right, tighten up." Uh huh. And so. Here's yeah. Here's one that I like to do. Pinch my finger. There you go. So you kind of, you kind of I was want, like, where are you putting your? You kind of want your tricep and your lat to feel like one super muscle. Does that make sense? And you can also, if they're not getting tense in the core, do where you poke me in the stomach. You can. You hey, can will also, you punch me in the stomach? You can also judo chop. <laughs> yep. Judo chop. Tighten up. Tighten up. You just take the blade edge of your hand. Tighten up your quads. And it does immediately. Your, you know, tighten up your lats. Tighten up your your obliques there. Pinch my finger. There we go. See what I mean? So between the shoulder blades, down into the armpit. You know, I mean, a, another good cue to like get people into their lats is just to cue the armpit. Armpit down and tight. Yep. Armpit down and tight. Triceps and lat is one super muscle. Yeah, so chop them. <coughs> pinch a finger. That will go a long way. Yeah. That's usually what helps you gotta like get in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, it does. I'm just going to get real personal with you. Well, sometimes, you know, I'll take, he used to take, take a pen. Yeah. Poke at me if you didn't want to, like, you know, be touching on someone. He would yeah. poke, poke with that. But I feel like the tactile piece of it, it is very, it helps because it, it immediately will, you know, you give them a cue and they're trying to do that. And then it's like, yes, that. And then you do it over and over again. And eventually it just sticks and they know what that feels like. So. Yeah, I think a lot of times saying something, you know, it, you can you have all these cues, but you don't know what it what it means, and you have to find the right way to say it to where then they're like, oh, that, and then yeah. they start feeling, you know, it carrying over to the actual lift, and then they know to do it. Right. Yeah. But again, the same thing with the with the feet. One of the other other things that is is you know for all of these lifts, especially with this, is your tripod foot because making sure for your bar path to go, you know up and down you want to and make sure that you're not like leaning over coming up um, letting your butt take over mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you are that is people will rock into their feet they'll rock on their heels and if you're really actively sometimes tripod foot but I will take my toe you know my my big toe and grab into so I'll think of doing that a lot too so when I'm at the bottom of my squat and I'm getting ready to come up I'll think big toe into the ground and it makes a difference because it helps make sure that you're rooted onto that midfoot. Yep. So just another cue. And, you, and everybody responds to different cues. Yeah. So that's one thing that I've learned is I think all the cues work. I just think it's finding for each individual yeah. what works, works. For, for them. Yeah. <laughs> so any other questions on the, I mean, mainly I just wanted to focus on the setup because I feel like it's a missed 
it's that's that really does truly get you ready for a big lift and and a lot that's where a lot of people they focus so much on the squat which is obviously important as well but this part is what I would consider a game changer for myself um, and for <clears throat> most everybody that I've worked with yeah yeah once you've worked on your squat mechanics body weight goblet squat the only the only other snafu that the back squat is going to give you is that awkward setup on your upper back so all else being equal, once you got your squat, all you got to do is work on your setup and you're in business. Yeah. Anything else for the squat? All right. So moving on into the pull up. All right, guys. So, you know, when I was thinking, OK, we're going through all the basic patterns, squat, hinge, push, pull. When I'm thinking about the pull, it's a little bit tricky because obviously we have one arm rows, we have barbell rows, we have inverted body weight rows. I'm sure you guys do like a lot of that stuff on like the rings and whatnot. And then obviously we have pull ups. So I thought in the interest of time and getting in some, some funky stuff that you may not have seen before, I think the pull up would be like the good kind of singular exercise that we could kind of break down that would check a lot of the pull boxes. Right? So even though it's a vertical, and obviously we know we need to work on a horizontal pull, I think you're still going to get a lot out of this. So all else being equal, you've done your core work, you've done your hinge work, you've done your squat work, we should have a pretty strong back. Right? So the thing with the pull is, is we want to make sure that we're, more than anything, getting in good scapular control. Right? So this, the shoulder, just like the hips, very, very mobile joint, which comes with pros and cons. So what I want to start with the pull is just some, some very simple kind of pregression work to the pull up. So you guys work uh, hollow body hangs? Stellar, stellar, stellar. So, uh, you know, you just get somebody comfortable up on a bar. I don't necessarily want to see super duper strict hollow body on day one. But if you can just get somebody hanging out, just comfortable hanging from a bar, this goes so far, so far into shoulder mobility and strength. Obviously, your grip here, too. So uh, do you guys introduce uh, like bar hangs in? Mm? Not in foundation. Well, like we'll do like a tiny warm up of seeing if they, if they are comfortable hanging, we'll do like hanging shrugs. Yeah. Yep. So Yeah, stellar, stellar. Um, the, more, the more people can hang and brachiate, I think the better. Hanging has really been shown to clear up a lot of shoulder issues, a lot, a lot of shoulder issues. And again, it's one of these things where you can get super in depth with it, but just doing it is, is the name of the game, just like carries. You don't really need to cue too much in the carries, you just need to do it. So, few things that I um, want to make sure that I went over. I'm glad you brought up the shrugs. So the first thing that, you know, the first skill up on the bar would be scapular depressions. Do you guys do these? Yeah. Cool. So we may not necessarily really need to practice these too much, but once somebody's got some good scap pull-ups, I like to break these up side to side. So taking a little bit wider grip, loose, pull left, loose, pull right, loose, pull left, loose, pull right. That's how you feel your lats. So let's try it. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to do a few just regular scat pulls to get your, uh, get your shoulders woken up, and then try <laughs> left and right. Good. So think about relaxing in between. Pull to the left. Good. Relax and pull to the right. Now, of course, this could be done banded. You know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be free body weight here. But ideally, what you'll really find is when you can tap into that deep lat, 
Whoa, it'll pull you way on over. Cool? So left and right scat. Sounds good? Now we can build it into a circle. So you're loose, pull left, pull right, loose left, loose in the right. Pull, pull, loose, loose. Then you can go around in a side to side <laughs> circle. Give it a shot. Pull, pull, loose, loose. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you guys are doing a great job at keeping your head neutral, right? You're not sticking your head out. You're not leaning side to side. You're staying nice and neutral. Solid. Cool, guys. So again, we've got two shoulders. They should be able to move independently, interdependently, right? You guys ever read... Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You guys know the difference between an independent relationship and an interdependent relationship? Probably one of, the best coach, one of the best hidden coaching books you can ever pick up. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you, if you read that book through the lens of fitness, you will find nuggets on every page. Highly recommend it. Highly, highly recommend it. But all that to say, what the hell does that have to do with shoulders? Uh, independent would be your left arm does whatever it wants and the right arm does whatever it wants. That's, that's a step in the right direction from dependency. I think we all know what a dependent relationship looks like. That's not good. But you must move on from independent to interdependent, which means that what the left side is doing, the right side supports it. What the right side is doing, the left side supports it. So you don't necessarily want to think about being able to be independent with your limbs and with your movement skills. You want them to be interdependent. You want them to feed into one another. Okay? So we all have asymmetries. We all have busted sides and strong sides and, and that whole thing. But when you can take some time to, get, to, to break some of these moves down into their constituent parts and see how they can feed into each other, this is how you can really unlock some hidden strength, if you will. And the side-to-side -side scat pull is a good example of that. Cool? So, bake that into the progression, like the scat pull progression. And then from there, just, uh, let's see. So, we know that you don't do pull-ups perfectly vertical. That actually doesn't really make any sense. Like you would kind of like scrunch into yourself and you would hit your head on the bar. So a pull-up is actually first a mini lever and then a pull. So you're actually creating space backward and then you pull. Does that make sense? So from here, our next scapular movement is going to be that same kind of depression, but you're going to be pushing yourself back. You wouldn't really want to be this dramatic in an actual pull-up, but we're just training the lats here. So, uh, take your grip, loose, and now just push yourself back and relax. See how that's like a mini lever? Push. And, you know, don't worry about trying to get your legs up. Just just try to close this armpit angle. Try, try three to five of those. Push yourself back. Try to push and hold. There you go. Push and hold for a couple seconds. Nice. Yeah. Great. Cool, guys. So does that make sense? So that's kind of the next step in the scapular progression. <clears throat> How, how's everybody's pull-ups? Everybody can do one to three. 
strict. It's only one way to do a pull-up. <laughs> Let's, <laughs> Let's not go there. Yeah, yeah. Told you, Casey. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're just going to add a pull-up into that little lever. <laughs> little lever, pull. Little lever, pull. And just for the sake of like feeling out the difference, go loose at the bottom. Pull up, loose. Lever, up, down, and relax. So do one to three. And you don't even have to do full range of motion. You don't have to go chin over the bar. Nice. These pull-ups look strong. Very good. Yeah. Dig it. All right, guys. Really, from here, especially from like a programming standpoint, we don't necessarily need to do a lot of these. I think you get the idea. <clears throat> Once we've got the straight arm hang, the hollow body hang, I like to you know, squeeze like a yoga block between the feet, like in a hollow body position. Anything that helps um, increase tension through the legs in this hanging position is dynamite. Maybe even um, if you have, I don't suppose you have like a, you have like light med balls. Yeah, that are like, like less. 10, 10 pound ones, that's the light one, yeah. Okay, if you get someone who's super strong, get someone to squeeze a 10 pound med ball between their feet in their hanging hollow body position, that's stellar. Um, yeah, so like I said, we want to turn all this stuff into full body movements. So when you're doing something like a pull-up, it's all arms and shoulders, we want to do stuff for the lower body to keep that engaged. Cool? So with that, um, again, depending on the client, you probably want to do a lot of flexed arm work as well. You don't necessarily need to do full pull-up repetitions to really get a lot of the, the benefit out of the pull-up itself. So doing a lot of the scapular work, a lot of this hanging work. And then when it comes to flex arm hangs, honestly, you probably want to go to rings. I mean, rings are, rings are great for all this stuff, right? So I like to start with um, chin grip. And I like to cue thumbs to delts. If you can get somebody maintaining contact thumbs to delts, and their neck is relaxed, and their legs are forward, that's a fantastic exercise. Then you can start working the negatives. Slow, slow, negatives. You know, certainly on the rings, as you come down, I like to go back to neutral. So you have like this natural corkscrew type effect. So do you guys do flex arm hangs? Give it a shot. Hop up on either two of, I mean, rings would probably be easiest, but rings or bar and try to get thumbs to delts or chest. And just hold there for 10 seconds or so. Like to even hold straight yeah. arm? Yeah, to hold straight arm. Yeah, so. Fantastic question. Um, so I have a lot of like skinny girls that can do a pull up. Yeah. And that's not their main goal, but I feel like it's super important pulling strength, so. Yeah. Fantastic question. So I'm glad you brought this up. So. <laughs> Those are probably the worst ones to grab. Sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> uh, hanging work, like I said, is just, is just so, so valuable. But yeah. it can be tricky, especially if somebody whose only other experience with pull-ups is in gym class, right. you know, which wasn't fun for me growing up, I can tell you that. <laughs> so so this, can be, this should be something that, you know, you handle with care yeah. with, with people. Um, so, yeah, you don't need to have them jump up onto a bar. I would say get some rings nice and low. 
And you can start them. Well, they had them a little bit higher. Right. Just straight arm hangs on the feet. Right. Flexed arm hangs on the feet. So bands, uh, bands I think are OK. But the more you can get people just used to controlling them, their own selves between the ground and whatever they're hanging on, the better. So just flex arm hangs here in this seated position, stellar. I'm, I'm absorbing about 50% of my body weight on my feet, stellar. And then, you know, they can even, you can even do your scap work here. Circles, pull, pull, stuff like that. There's also an exercise called the seat row, I believe that's what it's called, that has you going dynamically between a body weight row position and a flexed arm hang position. So this height may not be exactly right, but I'll demonstrate what I mean. We all set up for our body weight rows like this, right? Inverse tabletop. So this is a great exercise. You're going to pull yourself into a flexed arm hang as you sit your butt down. Tabletop, flexed arm hang. Tabletop, flexed arm hang. Let's try that. All right, is the rings that need to be at like a certain point, or are they need to be? Uh, they should. It should probably be a little bit lower. Yeah. So if you scoot those all the way to the right, maybe you can get both of these going. Maybe. So that's another great way to train all angles of the shoulder, from your closed angle in your horizontal to your open angle at your vertical. So tabletop, and then just sit your butt down into your flex arm hang. Is it? <laughs> there you go. Yep. So now, come up. Really, really set your butt back. There you go. Because you want to be vertical. Yeah, I, I get how this this could turn on the uh, the muscle up formula in your in your body there. Good. So sit your butt way down and way back. Yeah, you can just there keep it like yeah neutral. Now you can do it like Mark here, with arms out. You can do it neutral. You can do it flexed in like that. Yeah, so either. Uh, okay. Yeah, whichever. Fantastic. Okay. Cool guys. So is that a handy? Is that a handy move? Yeah. Now, the. The tough guy version of that, if you've got somebody who, let's say, let's say somebody who's got strong pull-ups, maybe somebody who's like working toward a muscle up, um, and maybe they need a combination of strength, mobility, lat engagement. This isn't, this really isn't in the muscle up progression because it's it doesn't necessarily translate exactly, but it's a great accessory drill. So this is called the lat fly. So the lat fly is a half pull up to where you bring yourself up to about 90 degrees. And then you're going to push and pull yourself. Okay. So you see, it's a <laughs> scapular retraction and that, that lever idea. And you go dynamically back and forth while keeping that 90 degree angle at the elbows. Give that a shot. <laughs> Just watch your head. There you go. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great for your mobility. Ah, nice. Yeah. 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 Well, you get that in the <laughs> there you go. Good. See how that far. Oh my gosh. There you go. Nice. Yeah. Good. 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 Good.
Yeah. Yeah, nice. Okay, Good. Cool. Ooh, yeah, you feel like the upper scaps on that. Yeah. Those will never move on me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's just this. You know? And it's a, you know, great thing for shoulder mobility. Yeah. Even, even, if you, even if you do it like kind of sloppy, you're still getting a tremendous benefit from it. Because you're still training the flex arm hang. You're still training your scapula in that position. And you're getting used to pulling and pushing back into that mini lever. So all of those little filler ideas in between your basic pull-up work, I think will go a long way. What's your take on clients who want to do the pull-up, they're not strong enough yet, whether it's keeping with ring rows or bands or whatnot, what's your idea on that? Um, the first part of your question, they, they want to or they... Yeah, you know, it's, it's like written in the workout and they're tired of doing ring rows. Tired of doing ring rows. We've got a lot of options. I'm just curious to hear yeah. what you would say. You know, setting up the rings or setting up a, uh, a bar and just having them do... Or what you could do is have somebody come up like with their feet and then body weight eccentric. So assisted concentric, body weight eccentric. Yeah, I like that. Working the eccentric of the pull-up is dynamite. Dynamite. Yes, yes, yes. Um, all else being equal, if somebody doesn't have a clean pull-up but they've got a lot of good strength, I just tell them to hop up. Five, four, three, two, one. It'll fry their lats. It'll fry their arms and they're going to be building the skill and the strength of the pull-up. Cool. Yep, for sure. One other quick thing that I want to make mention, brachiating. That's just, that's just single arm hangs. So, do you guys have monkey bars? No? Right, in front of each other? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So this is the next best thing. And then if you've got a super stud, scap pull up <laughs> one arm at a time. But going from one arm to the other, this is a very, very good shoulder exercise and progression into your pull up. We use some of those in our warm ups for like pull up stuff. Yeah. A little hip touch at the bottom. So you, you could kind of use that as a a test and sort of tell someone like, hey, if you don't have the ability to do this yet, you probably don't need to be able to be concerned with doing the pull up right now. Yeah? Correct. Got it. Correct. Doing those on the rings are really fun. Um, even, I, I used to work in a gym where we basically had a monkey bar ring setup where you could swing from ring to ring. That is phenomenal. <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah. So, you could maybe, you could, you could probably, if you gave a little bit of slack, you could probably swing from, <laughs> mm, well, maybe not. I uh, wouldn't we anyway. Have to, we maybe not. Sure who we have yeah. Yeah. But so, so, that, so that's the idea. Just lots of novelty. But you got to put in the time. You have to put in the time with the grip on the bar, on the rings. Yes, band it up if you need to. Use your own feet for assistance as much as possible, but work negatives, work variations to where people's hands don't just blow out, right? So that's why, that's why jumping up and just working negatives is so great. Obviously, chin-up grip, neutral grip, pull-up grip, narrow, medium, wide, it's all great. Lots of novelty, lots of, lots of variation is the name of the game there. Cool? Cool. Yes. Any questions with that stuff? Oh. All right, so we're gonna wrap up with the press. Sounds good? That's good. All right, Tracy Cook, school us on the bottoms up kettlebell press, please. My, that's my absolute favorite kettlebell exercise. And this is a great transition from all the pull work because this is all rotator cuff, 
scapular stability, grip strength. So this is all building off of itself. Yes, and from a programming standpoint, I always, we, uh, well, and Zach too, we always make sure that we complement a pull with a push because for shoulder health and, you know, long term, um, it, it helped with recovery. Having those corresponding, you know, push pull helps tremendously. So I'll have a bench, I'll do a pull. I'll do military presses, bottoms up presses, I'll have a pull. So I have those um, in every training session. For bottoms up, uh, and again, I said that, you know, we have carries, we have, we can do squats. I'll show a couple of the different things that we can do. The bottoms up press, I particularly like because of the impact with your shoulders. Um, it gives you training for military presses sometimes. If I do a lot, and I know with you all doing, you know, snatches, you do a lot of overhead work. Um, bottoms up press are good for training for military presses, for training your presses, but it's also just good to help with keeping your shoulder health. Um, and it also, it's, it requires, with, when you have that bell bottoms up, it requires that you have full body tension and that you are, it, it does work your um, balance and your grip a little, but like we were talking, we wanna make sure with the, you're not like death gripping it. It really is the balance and the fact that you're super tight um, with the, uh, with your um, overall body rather than just with your hand. So with the bottoms up press, uh, we will start at, we, we do a bottoms up clean. If somebody can't get that initially, it's fine to take, you know, get the bell into position. They can just, you know, get it up there, get it in position. I like doing it from the clean because that sets it up for the press and makes sure that they're super tight to be able to get that. Generally, with a bottoms up bell, you will start with um, about, one, so if you're pressing a 16K bell, you would bottoms up press maybe a 10 or a 12K bell. Um, so generally it's one bell. You'll probably start a little lighter initially because it's harder than, you know, than it looks. But to set up, I do my shoulder width stance. I'll get down, I get a good grip and I kind of root into the floor tripod stance with your uh, uh, tripod feet, making sure you're um, keeping that midfoot. And I'll bring it back. And then take a big breath, get tight, squeeze your butt. And then you'll swing it back through. Set it, again, the setup, just like with the swing, you set it up on the floor. You wanna set it back carefully on the floor when you're done. Um, when you get it here, I like to pause just to make sure I have control over that bell. I take a breath. It's, it's full body tension. So when, I'm, when I am pressing, and this is, goes across from military presses, bottoms up, any press, um, barbell presses, you really squeeze your glutes, squeeze your legs. So I start from the ground up. I have my feet rooted. I'm really tightening my legs, tightening my quads, tightening my glutes. The tighter I am, the faster that, that weight goes up. So I'll get here, I engage my core. It's, you know, plank position at the top, straight head, head up. You will see that I also squeeze my fist. I do that, especially when it gets heavier. Sometimes if it's lighter, I may not be thinking about it, but I really do try to treat the lighter bells all the way up to the heavier bells the same. So it's just, you know, comes naturally when I'm doing it. So when I do it, watch my, you know, watch my hand. I could try that one. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. well, let's go see. <laughs> we'll see. So 24. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll watch watch my hand watch my tightness because again when it gets heavy i have to make sure that i'm that i'm tight okay. Woo, hold on <laughs> tighten up Tracy. i know i have it's um humidity oh. yeah i was like i think i need some chalk <laughs> i'm like slipping
trickier than usual, but because <laughs> my hands are humid. <laughs> <laughs> so all that to say, keep your free hand close. Yeah. Protect your face. Yes. Keep an eye yeah. on it. Make sure you use chalk. Yeah. So, but with that, so you have to have, as you could see, I really had to have tight tension. I got really tight and I held it. So instead of getting here, make sure you really own, before you press it, make sure you really own it. It's fun because people will, even when I, when I have beginners, I get a really light bell and I will um, have them start doing that. They love it. And, and another key, um, key that's really important is when you're doing a military press, you're usually looking straight forward. Um, what I, with the, whenever anything is bottoms up, you want to watch the bell because what you don't want is I don't want to be holding a bottoms up bell and be watching this way and have it come. And so you watch if you watched. You know, I had the bell go up and then come back down and then hold it and then swing it through. It's fun though. So that's an exercise that one is really, really good for your shoulders and it's fun. So we'll do, we'll get, let's get some lighter, it is, you will want lighter bells. So take a lighter bell. <laughs> As you're pressing, yeah. think about yeah, it, tightening up the quads, tightening up your butt. So yep. Your shoulders yep. are the last part of the equation. Yep. Not the first. And then also the other thing of it, especially when it gets heavier, is I take I brace, I take my breath, and I will exhale to make sure to help give it that push sometimes. So, yep. So, Left arm's different. Yep, yep mine too. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Oh, nice. Really nice. There you go. Nice and slow. Yep. Solid. Nice. Solid. Yeah, nice. I like them. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and if your hands are slippery at all, they'll slip. Yep. <laughs> nice. Looking good, guys. So then the then the other thing for bottoms up, once you kind of get the once you get the oh, nice. So once you once you get so the, with the bottoms up, once you kind of get the clean and you can get it into the bottoms up position, again, you can do, I'll do double ones, but I like to do, and you can kind of, you know, try a couple of these that flow with all the stuff we've already gone over, where you'll clean it. You get it? You can do a squat. And you can do, which I personally love, our carries. So you have a heavier bell or even two of them, and you walk. I'll usually walk even just 10 <laughs> steps, turn around, walk back. Those are really good because, again, if you lose tension, lose tightness, it's just going to flip over. And then you get back. I am. <laughs> if I do these, will my biceps be as big as yours? Right, yep. <laughs> Guaranteed. I, I Guaranteed. <laughs> nice, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get it. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Go. Yeah. Nice. Smooth. Smooth. 
Nice. Nice. Yep. <laughs> remind, remind me of your name? Casey. So Casey is demonstrating something great in almost all of your reps. If, you know, close elbow, this is where it's most secure. She's out at 90. She's out at 90. No, but that's, the, it, yes. Yes. So if you're, you know, obviously we know kettlebells only come in so many weights so a good way to progress is this to stuff do that is to begin to work holds at 90 degrees plus or minus got it okay so you're starting here and then start here okay and then eventually work out here okay and then just go back down yeah that yeah in fact nice. you don't even have to work, <laughs> you don't even have to work the full press you could just do um yeah. Yeah, again, especially when you're talking about like shoulder rehab, you don't need to work the full overhead range of motion. In fact, I would only recommend going fully overhead with like maybe 20% of your volume on weights that you really, really own. The rest of the stuff could be carries, squats, holds, yep. high knee marches here. But you can also just do half press down half press or maybe 70% down. And what you'll find is you're working, I mean, you're still working all the same musculature, but when you own and you, and you what I call double tap through partial ranges of motion, you'll really get the effect of everything from the shoulders down, right, through the rest of the body. So bear that in mind, when you're talk, especially when you're talking about the bottoms up, Range of motion is secondary to owning the actual balance. Right. Then also some other variations would be like half kneeling to where you switch and you can do a couple. So you do that, you can do full kneeling. Yep, you can do Z presses. Yeah, so working your... So there's all different... Yeah, working your press from different stances <clears throat> is a phenomenal way to, to train and add variety into your press because you're, you're deleting and you're adding in extra challenge in that rooted sensation. Again, any standing exercise is first a foot exercise. So if you can split the stance, full kneeling, seated, all of that stuff is taking your feet out of the equation to some degree, and you're forcing the rest of the body to make up the difference. Go ahead, Marlon, you're right. Okay. Yep, stay tight, squeeze your butt. Got it. Yep. Oh. Ah. <laughs> it's loose, like, right? Yeah, that, I that know. That helps, that you mean, like, squeezing everything? Yep. Because it almost yep. first gives it up. There's a left arm, so <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> we all have the asymmetries. Interesting. Yeah, she's just straight cleaning it to 90. Like, right. There you go. Nice. There you go. And again, guys, try to keep your face relaxed. <laughs> when you, as you're going, uh, this is an interesting thing that maybe you could incorporate into like classes. You could do something like walk around and with a passive face spell your name backwards to your coach. K C A Z. Got it? Because wh what you want to do is you want to make you want to internalize this stuff. Step, step one, it's here. Step two, it's here. So a, a coaching method that I like to incorporate is getting people out of their heads 
when, when they're doing some sort of time under tension move. Make sense? So you could just tell a funny joke and just have people laugh. Anything to relax the face and to get them out of the mindset of, this sucks and I'm going to break my nose. How many people just spelled their name backwards? Oh, I did. <laughs> it's tough. So does that make sense? Cool. And, and for carries, you can also, you could have bottoms up in one, go down, pick up another bell regularly, like walk, carry, you know, yeah. then switch. There's yeah, like so carries. many variate, yeah. Do you guys practice presses regular grip? Yeah. Oh yeah, Mil military, right. you're just regular? Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, a lot. So I'll do, do those and I incorporate bottoms up, mainly for, I do a lot of bottoms up, one, because it's fun, but two, because of shoulders. Military presses, if I do a whole lot of volume, will start you know, taxing my shoulders more. But yeah, I do lots of military presses as well, just regular, strict. Are you just spelling, everybody <laughs> spelling every guy's name back to you? And with, and with the regular, you know, strict military press, um, it's all the same, you know, same, everything that I said with rooting your feet into the ground, squeezing your quads, squeezing your butt, squeezing your butt. I'll squeeze my other, you know, fist. It's all the same thing. It's just the bell is normal instead, you know, in the regular laying on my forearm instead of up. Nice. But sa all the same yeah. principles. Yeah. And it's fun. People yeah. like to every time it's we a train, challenge. it we gives them something. Anything really upside down. Anymore. Right. <laughs> and again, it's it's one of those things that we like because it does force you. You know, you can give cues all day long, but it forces you into a position because if you lose that tightness, you yeah. lose that tension. That bell's gonna. Yeah. So it just it is another training. Too, just like the plank. Yep. Like yep. Right on, guys. Okay. So we're gonna wrap up with the humble push-up. So if the press, specifically the bottoms up press as we went over, is our vertical push, obviously our push-up is our horizontal push. So, you know, when we're talking about hips, especially when we're talking about shoulders, always gotta be thinking about in what angles and in what planes are we, are we working, you know, from. So the push-up, man, done. Strict, done simply, is just, is just a beautiful exercise. And if someone can execute 10 perfectly strict push-ups, well, you're, you're kind of talking about a rare breed of person. So what do I mean? What do I mean about a strict push-up? Well, a couple of things. Just to reiterate all the stuff that we've been talking about all day. Total body tension while simultaneously staying relaxed in the face. So, I like, to, uh, I like to start from here. Wide fingers and fingertips grip the ground. Feet just outside of uh, maybe hips width and heels pushing backwards. Remember how we talked about the triceps and the lats becoming one super muscle in the pull-up bar? Ideally, that's definitely the case here. So we're corkscrewing the arms into the ground. So see how I'm pushing my elbow pits forward. So that way when I come down, I'm coming down, down and slightly forward. And when I'm at that bottom position, I'm thinking about squeezing my triceps into my lats. Simple as that guys. So let's knock out a set of five, relatively slow. Three to five. Uh, you guys are probably, your, your shoulders are probably a little bit fried at this point. But I want you to think wide fingers, fingers grip the ground, and let's knock out a set of five. Pinch your triceps into your lats at the bottom. And push. If I may, yes. challenge you ladies to get a little bit closer with the elbows. Fantastic. Fantastic. Stellar. Good. Cool guys. So, the push up 
should first respect all of the principles of the plank. Which, just as a quick refresher, as, as I think uh, Tracy mentioned in the bottoms up press, we want to go for this zipped up effect, wherein we're tensing every muscle group, not at once, but rather in a sequence. So when you set up for this next set of your push-ups, I want you to go over, and I'm actually going to cue you through it. I want you to go over the sequence. Tighten the quads. I actually want you to feel your quads burning. I want you to feel like they're almost cramping. You guys have had quad cramps, right? You can get them here. Cramp your quads. Then, cramp your glutes. This should be very uncomfortable. I am very uncomfortable right now. <laughs> <laughs> then, tighten the abs, as in the tug of war plank. Screw the arms into the ground. Triceps against lats. See how I'm shaking? Maybe a little bit. See how I kind of almost have like a pseudo dive bomber kind of, kind of position? So I'm kind of thinking about, because I am protracting a little bit there, and I am getting a posterior pelvic tilt, I'm kind of going out and down. But I want you guys to feel that. So get in your position. I'm going to cue your engagement. So tighten the quads. Hard, harder, hardest. Tighten your glutes. Hard, harder, hardest. Screw the arms into the floor. Elbow pits forward. Pull yourself down into the squat. I mean, into your <laughs> push up to the floor, whatever the hell we're doing. And drive yourself up. And relax. Are right, you guys feel the difference? Yes. <laughs> All right. So, when we're talking about something as simple as like a push up, we want to fill in the gaps. Like, we don't, we don't want to do easy exercises or simple exercises just because they're easy and simple. We want to find ways, we want to find the hidden benefits within them. And the push-up, it's kind of like a blank slate that you can inject all sorts of little cues into. Cool? So, really, it's as simple as that. It's taking all of this internal bodily tension stuff that we've been going over and we're just moving into it like this into our simple push-up when you can get that down stuff like one arm push-ups become in the ballpark for you to do cool so again this is a great time to work time under tension in the context of a class or a personal training session so you get people set up like, like we're about to do, and we're gonna work a five second negative and a five second positive. You guys ever done those? Five second down, five second up? Yeah. Probably not yeah. with the amount of tension we're about to have. Probably not, <laughs> but let's give it a shot. So, let's get back into your tall plank position. Is your foot position simply for like more balance, the width? Yes, yeah, so I like, I like a slightly, I like hip or slightly wider because that allows me to squeeze my glutes and get a little bit of that external torque, that external rotation. Your mileage may vary, so feel free to experiment, but a little bit wider with the feet will typically help the glute engagement. All right, guys, so neck neutral, eyes gazing slightly forward, your face is relaxed, tighten the quads, hard, then harder, then hardest, and you should feel the difference with every single one. Squeeze your glutes, hard, harder, hardest. Screw the arms into the ground, get those lats on. And come down five, four, three, two, pause. And come up, five, four, three, two, one. And relax, good. One is great. <laughs> cool. You know what? I think if you just took some time to add in some of that extra intention throughout your entire body, the humble push up can take you far. The only other maybe kind of fun, funky variation that I want to go over today 
is a lopsided push-up using a heavy kettlebell. So that would look like this. You're going to come down, and obviously you're getting an extra stretch into the elevated side. I'm not going chest to deck because that would kind of tear my shoulder apart. So I'm staying, you know, a good ways up off the floor here, but I'm getting a good pec stretch on that kettlebell side. Then as I come up. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was magic. I know, it looked like he was like, <laughs> <laughs> he was like floated up there. You will too. So when you're holding the top here, you're square with the hip, you're square with the shoulders, and you will feel this oblique. You will feel this tricep, you will feel this lat if you're pulling down. Now, same kind of thing, you can, you can modify this based on your own strength and control. So I'm gonna go down as far as I can on one arm, then I'm gonna catch myself, okay? Catch, down. Then I'm gonna do the opposite on the way up. I'm gonna remove my hand as soon as my strength allows. Got it? So that might mean, that might mean that you come all the way down, you push all the way up, and then you remove your arm. That's totally fine too. It might mean you catch yourself and then you come down. That's totally fine too. You can see how this is a variation where you can hack it yourself. Use a heavy bell. Do not do this on anything lighter than 24 kilos. I've seen it happen. <laughs> so, let's just try three. Let's try three slow on each side. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Good wide foot position. Another thing that I do a lot when I'm doing these, just kind of like I did with the press, is with my opposite arm that's coming up, I squeeze it because that almost just helps reinforce the tension. So sometimes making a fist as you come up just will also help with that. Very nice. Yeah, and so I mean, Corey, you were talking about like working that shoulder protraction. Yeah. This is a great way to train that one arm at a time. When you come up onto that kettlebell, you can really protract through that shoulder. You know, you could do a little lean, a little twist out at the top. Cool, guys. Okay. So, nice. <laughs> any questions on any of the press stuff? No pressing questions. No pressing questions. <laughs> Cool guys, well hopefully what you've gleaned here today is a lot of little tips and tricks that you can incorporate tomorrow morning with your clients and with your students. Little stuff. And ideally, really what we gave you here is not so much, you know, ideally a lot of these cues will give you ideas that, that you kind of you kind of modify and you make your own. You know, hopefully we've kind of shown you anchor points that you can jump off from, not using them as anchor points to anchor yourself in, into one idea or into one cue. That's, I think, the best, the best way to look at any type of new information, to say, how can I immediately apply this to a specific student or a specific class or a specific goal or program and how can I make this my own? What is this kind of like? For example, with the, the elevated push-up thing that we just did there, that was just my way of hacking, okay, I love to do one-arm push-ups. 
but if I do more than 10 in a day, my arm falls off. So how can I use the idea of asymmetric loading? How can I use the idea of extra range of motion for extra stretch and, and pec work? And how can I make sure that I can do it at the drop of a hat with no equipment, save what I already have in the backseat of my car? That's how that particular exercise was born. And then you can, you can build off of that, you know? So you just add and subtract little ingredients, pieces of all these lifts. So that's the minutia, and then when you build that out into the idea of training someone over the intermediate to long term, you can see how you can mix and match a lot of this stuff to keep people progressing, and how you can plug these ideas into the larger training schema. Well guys, just a couple of things to wrap up. Number one, let's give Corey a big hand yeah. for, <laughs> for, for entertaining my calls and my emails to, to do this thing. This is, this is something that, I, uh, that, that we really enjoy doing. Um, and thank you for being willing to be on camera and, and on the internet. So this will be a long form video. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, you guys will be able to it. reference. You guys will be able to reference this stuff, you know, forever because it'll it'll be on YouTube. And we um, have intentions of having a similar seminar for our members in another month or more. Yep. Right? Totally. So then Absolutely. Now that we know who he is, and we say, "Hey, Zach, this strength and kettlebell guy is coming out to do this." We can reference that. Yeah. yeah. Not unless you give us like a little quick circus kettlebell demonstration of. Fancy moves before you leave. Ooh. No, you got some. <laughs> or unless she wants Bro. to do it. <laughs> well, we will wrap up with that. Yeah. We, will, we will wrap up with a, uh, a demonstration. The only other thing that I wanted to make mention, as you guys probably know as coaches and as service providers, testimonials from people who experience your coaching, your service, is probably the most important thing that you could prioritize uh, for marketing and promotion purposes. So with that, I would like to say, if you got great value out of your time here, I would love for you to pull Connor aside and just give a 10 to 30 second spiel about what you learned, what your favorite part was, and that would mean the absolute world to me and Tracy, because uh, this is how we are able to pitch this to other gyms. Or if being on camera isn't your thing, by all means, I will send a follow-up survey, testimonial survey, that I would really appreciate your feedback with as well. So do keep all that in mind, and that's it. What, what kind of tricks do you want to do? <laughs>